we're going to start this uh, last session that is going to begin now at three and it's going to be until um, the end of our first um, EMT summer school, which should be around um, 530. Uh, at that time, we will wrap up our session. We will begin with a, a talk on audio description training course design um, by Gert Verkaufteren. Did I get your name right? Thank you. Did it right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I was talking about the question of names. Okay. And Gert is a lecturer at the University of Antwerp and a member of the TRIX or T R I C S research group and the Open Expertise Center for Accessibility Media and Culture. He teaches media accessibility and translation technology, and his research focuses on different aspects of audio description. He was involved as a researcher in a recent ACT or ACT and Ad Lab, or I would say AD Lab Pro Project, funded by the European Union. He was guest editor of a recent volume on uh, the training in media accessibility and co author of a recent paper on course design in audio description, which was published in the Interpreter and, Tra and Translator Trainer. Um, Gurk, whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Thank you, Sandra, for this very nice introduction. And, and thank you uh, for having me here. It's uh, great to see that so many people are still here on a Friday afternoon. Uh, and it's great uh, to see that, um, well, apparently we're not just, uh, we're not, um, we're also practicing uh, what we preach because everybody has uh, neatly audio described themselves. Uh, the live transcript is working really great. Um, so let me continue and also briefly describe myself. Um, I am in my 40s, mid 40s, I should say. Uh, unlike Jorge this morning, I am not uh, cleanly shaven. Uh, I have a, um, well, salt and pepper beard. Uh, but as I learned this morning, apparently it's a new trend. So without knowing it, I'm a bit hip. And um, I am wearing a white shirt with uh, light blue little flowers and um, dark blue uh, leaves. And in the background, uh, there are large windows uh, overlooking my garden. Um, so now to my presentation and I'll uh, start sharing my, uh, my screen. Let's see uh, if this works. Um, this should. do the trick yes you can see the powerpoint presentation now yes yes great um yeah so first of all i i slightly um changed the title of of the presentation um because uh, in the end i realized that str uh, strategies tools and uh, technologies in, in in course design uh, is not really adequate uh, because you can talk about strategies when designing a course but actually the tools and the technologies, they come, they come later, they come when you actually teach. Uh, so I put the technologies in brackets. And then rather than pretending I am, I am uh, inventing the wheel here, um, I decided to make it, make it a bit more concrete and um, tell you about the course that we actually designed uh, in audio description in uh, the AdLab Pro uh, project. Uh, and when I say we, um, as you can see, it's a, it's a whole consortium. Um, it was led by the University of Trieste and there were more uh, academic partners, namely the University, the Autonomous University of Barcelona, uh, the Adam Mikievich University of Poznan, uh, and then uh, us as the University of Antwerp. Uh, we had some um, participants, some, some partners from the industry, Utopian Voices and uh, Sound Focus. We had a broadcaster in the project RTV Slovenia, and then we had the end users uh, there um, represented by the Royal National Institute of Blind People. Now, first, uh, a bit of background. Uh, the Adla Pro project that we had uh, was a follow-up of, of the 2011-2014 Adla uh, project. And uh, the Adla project had actually two goals. Um, 
audio description being relatively new um, back then, uh, we wanted to map uh, the current situation of AD in Europe uh, at that point. And um, more importantly, probably as a final deliverable, uh, we wanted to draw up international guidelines or strategies, if you like, uh, for audio description, uh, which are freely available uh, at the website of the Adlab project. Um, and if there is time at the end, I can briefly uh, show you what it looks like. Now, and what we noticed in the Adlab project was that um, there was an ever-growing demand uh, for audio description. Um, more and more broadcasters companies started to provide AD, um, but what was lacking at the time were um, concrete courses in which AD um, was being taught. So for the next step, we decided or we wanted to create a course uh, in audio description. Um, before turning to the, the actual uh, course, some background and, and most of the things we already heard uh, earlier today, um, we had to operate um, in, in a context in which translator uh, training was and actually still is um, continuously developing. Um, a lot of the talks we already heard talked about new technologies, uh, such as uh, the integration of CAD tools in audiovisual translation, uh, machine translation, the advent of, of cloud-based software that we had to take into account. Um, there are uh, new translation services being offered, uh, which in turn lead uh, to new professional, professional profiles uh, being created. Um, I remember uh, Emilia asking uh, Elena this morning uh, when, when talking about the opera description, is there a person who can provide the whole range um, of services that are needed to make something, so to make such a performance and event accessible? Uh, and so there is, um, there was a project that uh, created um, a profile um, for an accessibility manager who, in theory, should be able to provide all this, these services. Um, there is the audio describer and a course was um, designed and I'll talk about it, the, the Adlab Pro course. And then, and we'll hear about it more later today. Uh, there is uh, the new profile of the re-speaker, both intralingual and uh, interlingual, uh, which also has been uh, the subject, the topic of a, uh, a European project, the ILSA project uh, that recently ended. Now, in addition to uh, this, uh, these developments in translator training, um, there are also evolutions in pedagogical design. And um, we also talked about it, uh, we heard about it when Alina and Ernie Lindsay talked about uh, AVT in the classroom. Um, more and more uh, courses are becoming learner-centered, given uh, that in the field of AVT, the field of media accessibility, um, we have very close links uh, with the industry, with the end users also. Um, Project-based learning, situated learning um, are becoming ever more important. And uh, thanks to technological developments, uh, there are new possibilities. Um, thank, uh, thank God they are there because what, what we noticed uh, in the last two years when we had to move uh, online all of a sudden. Uh, thank God there are things like e-learning, uh, there are blended learning um, scenarios. You can do self-based learning in the context of MOOCs or SPOCs. Um, so also these uh, developments had to be taken into account when, when designing the course. And then obviously uh, there are the very specific, um, the very specific um, characteristics, let's say, of audio description as a form of translation. Um, it's a very diverse field, uh, including uh, different modalities such as uh, recorded description for film or for television. Um, what we already heard about this morning in Elena's talk, uh, live uh, AD for uh, opera, for theater, for dance performances. There is AD for museums, uh, for heritage, uh, heritage sites uh, that can be both live or recorded. And uh, AD itself can be combined with audio subtitles, with audio introductions, with touch tours. Uh, so all different parameters to take into account. 
And um, moreover, um, returning uh, to, to translation, uh, as it were, it's, it's one of the first actual types of, of intersemiotic translation. And, and we um, train our students most of the time we train them in, in interlingual translation. So this intersemiotic dimension is also something new um, that we had to, to cater for somehow. And then um, audio description is uh, like, I suppose any form of, of, of uh, audiovisual translation part of a much larger whole. Um, in addition to analyzing uh, the text and, and writing the script, uh, you have to be aware of the fact that your audio description has to be voiced, uh, that the, the the voice description has to be mixed with um, with the, the 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 rest of the product, the rest of the audiovisual text. So um, learners also have to be aware of these these technological uh, steps in the process. Um, so against this background and, and, and within this context, what we wanted to do uh, basically was design a course that is in the first place modular. Um, modular um, so that learners um, only need to focus on what is relevant uh, for them. If you want to, um, if you, you work, let's say, as a subtitler at a broadcaster, you may be interested in, in um, AD for the screen, but not so much in AD for uh, museums. So then you only could take uh, the part that's relevant for you. Um, we wanted a course that is um, flexible, and I'll come back to that later. I'll show how we integrated that um, so that the learners can learn um, when they want, where they want, in the format that they want. And again, um, being aware of, of the close links um, between universities and um, the industry, we wanted a course uh, that was useful uh, in both these, uh, these contexts. Um, the aim of, of um, the design was um, a course that comprises six modules. First of all, uh, there is a, a general module um, that provides an introduction on, on, on general elements uh, relevant in AD, um, focusing a bit on uh, the intersemiotic, the multimodal part, uh, so AD as part of an audiovisual text. Uh, it focuses on, on uh, the different types of AD, uh, on the various um, possible target audiences of AD, and also um, for people from academia looking at uh, central issues in, in AD research. And the idea behind this general module was that um, learners need this basic knowledge to be able to complete uh, the following modules. Uh, module two then uh, focuses on um, what is probably traditionally uh, the, the, the most widespread um, type of AD, um, namely film for um, uh, AD for film and television. And um, it focuses on uh, genres, uh, on uh, film language, uh, on content selection, uh, but also on more technical uh, issues such as the software uh, you can use to create audio descriptions, um, which uh, in fact is not different uh, from the subtitling software that we that, that has been um, presented earlier today. Uh, in fact, the main difference is that rather than spotting um, the blocks when people are talking, you spot the blocks within uh, or between uh, different um, dialogues. Then module three uh, focuses on, on the AD of, of live events. Um, so looking at how opera, theater, dance performances can be made um, can be made uh, accessible, um, but it also focuses on uh, let's say more external uh, aspects uh, such as uh, touch tours, um, audio introductions, uh, also again the technical skills that you need, and um, probably even more important than with screen AD. Uh, the entire workflow of making an opera or a theater play um, accessible. 
Uh, then the fourth module moves to uh, static art, so museums and uh, environments, heritage sites, uh, which can be described both uh, live with uh, specific um, uh, audio described guided tours, or um, which can be uh, provided with recorded AD uh, in, in the form of an, um, an adapted um, audio guide. And in addition to these two main uh, branches, um, it also looks at uh, the different stakeholders uh, involved, because as was already said earlier today, um, we need so many uh, skills, competences, we, we need so much knowledge um, when we want to make products accessible, that often we need uh, help from from others, for example, when when describing paintings, it's good to have a curator um, or uh, someone specializing in in art uh, there to assist you. Then in module five, um, the course focuses on additional services. Um, the additional services um, being um, audio subtitles. So when the dialogues in the production you are uh, describing are also in a foreign language uh, and the alternatives, uh, which are an adapted uh, dubbing or uh, an adapted voiceover. And I'm saying adapted because in these cases, the dubbing, the voiceover, but also the subtitles um, have to interact with uh, the audio description and may not be exactly the same as the ones provided for the original, uh, the original product. And then finally, in the last module, um, specific technical issues and new uh, developments are tackled. And um, uh, the, the units there, for example, focus on um, translation uh, of existing audio descriptions, um, both human translation, machine translation, um, but also, um, for example, on uh, other ways of making uh, productions uh, accessible. Um, so more going towards uh, accessible filmmaking, for example. Now, all modules have um, a similar structure. Uh, they all start with some core videos uh, in which, uh, let's say, the basic concepts that are relevant uh, are being explained. And these core videos all have the same, the same structure. Uh, they are all uh, recorded PowerPoints, PowerPoint presentations with uh, a narration. Um, these core videos are all um, subtitled, as you can see, in, in, in different languages, uh, Catalan, in Dutch, in English, in Italian, uh, in Polish, and in Slovenian. So basically in all uh, the project, uh, project languages. Um, these core videos are also uh, available as uh, the PowerPoints themselves. So trainers can reuse them, can adapt them when they want to integrate them in their own course. Uh, and they're also available as uh, transcripts so that learners can use these transcripts to uh, make additional notes, for example. Uh, in addition to um, these core videos, there are additional videos, and, and these are more varied. They can be... Um, I'm sorry, there can, I'm, I'm just going to have to stop here for a minute because there was a big thunders, uh, a thunder, thunder and my dog is escaping. So if you would give me one more minute, this is so unexpected, but uh, I'll be back in a second. <laughs> first and hopefully the last time I have to go and save my dog during a presentation. Um, so yes, let's hope we can go to live events again soon and we're not allowed to bring dogs to presentations anymore. Um, so yes, I was at the additional videos, um, which are a bit more varied, offer more in-depth um, uh, insights into the world of audio description. Uh, for example, blind people 
um, talking about their experience when going to museums or um, short videos showing how theater plays are uh, being described live. So giving more, let's say, uh, concrete uh, examples. All modules also have their own reading list, um, which uh, contains the most relevant um, publications uh, on the topic um, that's being discussed. And of course, there are also uh, different tasks um, that can be uh, done uh, within the module. And finally, for every module, there's also a trainer's guide uh, explaining uh, to trainers how the different materials can be used. And then finally, and I put this in, in red, uh, there is, of course, when you do the course, an, an assessment, and that's actually something uh, that is missing uh, in the Adela Pro course, uh, something that we discussed in, in, in the work group uh, with Emilia earlier already, um, because that's something that I feel is still missing in audio description, namely, um, standardized, let's say, um, assessment uh, procedures. These are needed. Uh, there's definitely uh, more research is needed to, to uh, develop these. So maybe that's uh, for another uh, follow-up project. Uh, so now moving from um, the course itself to the approach we took. Now, as I already said, um, Pedagogical design is moving towards uh, learner-centered uh, design more and more. So we also started in our course for uh, from the learner uh, with uh, his or her uh, specific uh, characteristics, uh, which can be very different depending on whether it's, for instance, um, an MA student or let's say someone working in a museum. Um, they all have to um, attain um, to, to, to um, acquire the, the course objectives through uh, specific targeted learning activities. So um, this is actually the what uh, of, your, uh, of the course design. And um, these learning activities all take place in um, a very concrete learning uh, environment with different learning units, the units um, I um, discussed before working with specific learning materials, using different uh, learning and or teaching methods and providing um, adequate support. And all this is in part also being determined by uh, the specific uh, context I already men mentioned a couple of times, uh, whether it's an, an academic institution or a subtitling company or a broadcaster, um, the conditions uh, in which the course is used can be radically different. So uh, there may be other needs, other objectives, uh, other materials and learning methods uh, being used. Now, uh, first, uh, the learner, uh, he, he or she can have uh, domain specific knowledge. They may already know what audio description is. They may already have uh, created a few audio descriptions themselves. Um, but predominantly in, in, in academic context, in, in, in master courses, um, they do not have uh, this specific knowledge yet. Uh, so that's why we provided the introductory model. Now, depending on what um, context the learner comes from, they may have a different personal motivation. Um, someone working in a museum, for example, may uh, want to learn how to create an um, audio described tour guide, um, but a student who wants to pursue a PhD um, in media accessibility uh, may want to know about the, the current state of the art in AD research. So that's what, why we provided different modules for different modalities. And then uh, the learner may have um, more or less uh, develop metacognitive strategies, um, including uh, skills such as planning uh, or self-reflection. Um, they may or they may be more or less uh, autonomous when they work. Uh, they may like or not like uh, to work in groups. Uh, so that's why we included various uh, types of tasks and uh, various time paths uh, for the course. 
Then, um, and, and Lindsay already uh, talked about it a bit in, in her presentation, um, what's crucial for every course uh, are uh, the learning outcomes. You need to know beforehand what uh, the student has to know uh, at the end of the course. And the same goes for the course design. You need to know what objectives you have to reach at uh, the end of the course. You need to know what learning outcomes have to be acquired before you can start uh, designing um, your course. So what we did for um, the Adla Pro course is we formulated, uh, first of all, um, outcomes for all the levels of the course. So that's, that means an outcome for the, the course as a whole, then second level outcomes for the different modules, and then third level outcomes for all uh, the different learning units. Um, that we didn't do anything fancy. We didn't invent new um, approaches. Um, we used, um, let's say, a very popular, um, well-known um, tech, the taxonomy, namely the one um, created by Bloom, but as revised um, early in the 2000s um, by Kratwal. Um, so this te uh, taxonomy actually says there are uh, six levels, or it uses six levels um, of, of thinking. Um, these are um, hierarchical, building on each other, becoming more difficult as uh, you go up uh, the ladder. And um, Normally, if, if you want to design your course in the right way, you should make sure that all levels are um, present in uh, your course. There has been uh, some discussion on whether um, these have to be applied in this order, um, because you can imagine that, for example, students first want to, or, or you want your students um, to do an, an analysis of a text first, and then uh, come back and see if they understand um, what they just analyzed. Um, but what we did is we just used them or we tried to use them in, in, in this order, although uh, there may be deviations. Now, let me give some concrete examples, uh, starting from the, the lowest level, which is the knowledge level. Um, and basically this, this knowledge level um, means that the student um, should have the ability um, to recall or, or, or to remember uh, facts, uh, but without uh, necessarily uh, really understanding them. So an, an, a possible learning outcome there uh, could be uh, that the student can name uh, the different types of uh, AD. Moving to um, the second uh, level, uh, comprehension. Well, as the name already says, uh, the student there should be should have the the ability to understand um, and and interpret what they learn. And an example here could be that uh, the student has to be able uh, to differentiate between essential uh, or need to have information in AD and uh, secondary or uh, nice to have information in AD, which may be uh, particularly crucial in, for example, film AD, if you only have a few seconds um, between dialogues to describe what you, uh, what you see on screen. The third level then um, is uh, what is called application. And so it, this means obviously that you are able to um, apply what you learn in new situations so that you can uh, put the knowledge uh, that you acquired uh, to work in, for example, solving problems. For example, um, referring back to the previous one, uh, using um, knowledge about primary and sec secondary education to create a description, or um, as the one suggested here, um, that the student can employ uh, a writing style that is adapted to the genre of the film or of the play or the opera uh, that has to be um, audio described. Um, for example, if you're describing a children's uh, program, uh, you will have to adapt um, your, uh, your language, uh, your writing style to that target um, audience. And it would be nice to know, but maybe not today, but later, um, uh, Elena, what you did uh, at the opera, because I saw some of the workshops you worked with, uh, with children, how you adapted um, your working style uh, to that target audience. Um, then the fourth level, analysis, again, 
uh, taking it one step further, um, is that you can you are able to to break down all the knowledge, all the information you have um, in in different components and look at the interrelationships um, between them. Uh, for example, as suggested here, uh, that the student can analyze an audiovisual text uh, in terms of requirements for AD, so that they have a sound knowledge of multimodality, uh, know how the different sign systems, the different meaning-making systems interact, um, so that they know what uh, additional information um, a blind or a partially sighted uh, person needs. And then um, the, the last two levels, synthesis, is uh, the opposite, more or less, that you are able to put parts uh, together. Uh, for example, that um, the student can summarize, or the learner uh, can summarize all the tasks uh, of the people involved in the creation of an AD uh, for film. So not just uh, the audio describer, but also the voice talent, the technician uh, putting all the components together. And finally, uh, evaluation uh, is, uh, well, the ability to, to judge the value of the material uh, for a given uh, pers uh, purpose. Um, so as a last step that the learner or the student can revise, uh, for example, AD content uh, in terms of technical requirements, for example, uh, reading speed, uh, to name but one. Um, so in the next steps, um, when you want to start teaching uh, these learning outcomes, there's also uh, various things uh, we had to take into account, we had to consider. Um, not everybody uh, wants to learn uh, in the same way. Uh, so we had to provide uh, tasks, we had to provide materials that cater for different learning styles. And I'll, I'll give a few examples on the next slide. Um, not everybody is happy with uh, the same learning or teaching method. Um, there's also a, a certain hierarchy in, in learning methods that I will explain in a minute. Um, so we also wanted uh, to provide various uh, different model, uh, methods. And then in our structures, structure, uh, we wanted to make sure that the activities, the tasks we gave them um, became uh, more challenging uh, more uh, more complex uh, as uh, they progressed in the course, but making sure that also earlier uh, skills uh, were trained um, again, so an, an iterative, as it says, scaffolded structure. Uh, as far as the learning uh, styles are concerned, um, we were aware that there are various theories out there. Um, in the end, uh, we chose for, for uh, the one developed by Fleming, the Varg uh, model, uh, which is widely accepted and we found uh, was um, easily applicable or, or um, generally applicable in, in blended contexts uh, with a practical aim as the course we liked and we wanted to design. And um, so the abbreviation stands for uh, four different styles. First, visual learning. Uh, hence the video materials we, uh, we created. Then uh, auditory uh, learning. So uh, the voice explaining uh, or, or uh, telling or presenting the PowerPoints, if you like. We provided reading materials. We had the videos uh, materials as transcripts for those who like uh, to read and, and write as a learning style. And uh, particularly in the tasks, uh, there were also tasks where, they, where, where learners actually have uh, to do uh, some uh, concrete uh, things, so kinesthetic uh, learning. Then as far as the learning methods um, were uh, concerned, we based ourselves on, on, on a recent model um, that was actually um, devised um, or developed for um, teaching in, in blended, uh, in online uh, contexts by uh, Laurier. And um, she um, has, or, or she, she defined five different uh, learning methods. The first one being uh, learning uh, through acquisition. And um, this is actually uh, also what in, in, in Bloom's uh, typology, in Bloom's taxonomy is the lowest level. Uh, that is that steward, uh, students or learners acquire 
um, basic knowledge, for example, by attending lectures, uh, by reading uh, written educational materials, um, by listening to podcasts, for example, or watching videos. So this is a rather um, passive uh, learning method when where students, learners just um, absorb new information. The second uh, learning style, um, inquiry, um, corresponds more or less to um, Bloom's second uh, level. Um, learning through inquiry um, requires students also to understand um, what they learn and to um, go and find uh, resources um, for themselves and to process them actively to expand uh, their knowledge. And then the last three uh, learning methods, um, well, they are uh, self-evident um, from the name. So learning through discussion, uh, learning to practice to doing and learning through collaboration. Um, and these correspond to the higher uh, level steps in Bloom's um, uh, typology uh, taxonomy. Um, now, finally, let me give you some uh, a practical example of how uh, we integrated all this knowledge in um, concrete uh, tasks in the course. Uh, and I'm going to give the example of AD script writing. So the first task we designed there was a class uh, discussion. Um, first of all, where to see uh, whether students can name uh, the different uh, constituents of, of the story. There is um, one unit uh, dealing with um, narratology. It's a very basic introduction. But in, in, in most, or not in most, but in many of, uh, of the, the audiovisual products that are being uh, described, uh, they, have a, they, they tell a story, they have a narrative structure of some sort. Uh, so basics, basic insights in, in, in um, the main building blocks con, uh, constituents of, of this story uh, is relevant. So this is the first learning outcome that the students can name uh, these different building blocks. And then in a second uh, learning outcome, uh, through a discussion uh, explaining why uh, the knowledge about this diff these different constituents is needed uh, when you want to create an audio description. Now, in the second uh, task, we, we took it a step further um, and we went on to analyze uh, a scene from, it says X here, so it can be um, an episode of a TV series, it can be a film, it can be a scene from a theater play, an opera, um, so any um, performance. And um, we use, or the idea is to use an audio described scene where, uh, as a third learning outcome, the students uh, identify uh, the different strategies uh, that are being used. As you can see, so it's, it's um, in Bloom's taxonomy, the analysis, and uh, it's learning through inquiry to make sure that all levels, all uh, methods are there. And then um, making it a bit, even a bit more um, complicated, a bit more difficult, students can also assess the linguistic choices made by an audio describer. So in this case, they had to evaluate um, the end product. And again, um, by means of a class uh, discussion. And then finally, uh, in a third task, uh, on, on AD script writing, uh, students are asked to create an AD for a scene themselves. Um, so um, they create an AD for a clip. Um, and um, actually, there are various options here. You can ask them to work uh, separately. So it's just practice or also uh, to work in group, uh, working to um, collaboration. And then finally, uh, a last um, learning outcome would be that students can defend their uh, choices, the choices they made uh, in their AD. Uh, so again, uh, evaluating what they've done on the higher level in, in the hierarchy and uh, learning through uh, discussions. Um, which brings me to my last um, slide, um, saying that um, 
all these materials are freely available, um, which is good, I think. And I don't know. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my uh, screen now. Um, I don't know um, if I still have some time, because if I do, then I can very briefly show you uh, the, the the website, uh, Sandra, but it's up to you to decide if it's there is one. I can show it in one minute or two minutes. I have about 10, eight more minutes. So, yes, I think you can show oh, it. I don't need 10 more minutes. I think two minutes and I can show you the right. website. Um, so I'll... I'll share my screen again um, so if all is well you should now be seeing uh, the website of both uh, the adlab project is that correct sandra you can you can see the screen right yes we can okay great great yeah so in the end we decided to create one uh, one um, website for both the projects since they build on each other. And uh, the, so the site is adlabproject.eu. In, on, on in the first part, uh, you can find um, the set of guidelines of strategies that we developed um, for, uh, for the course, for, for, um, not for the course before AD. They are available in English, uh, definitely in Dutch. And I think also in, in German or Italian, but I'm not entirely sure. And then the second website is the one of Adla Pro, and I'll briefly show you um, how that looks like. Um, so you have obviously the, the, um, the explanation of the project, um, but from the first page, you can go to the course materials. Um, which brings you to a site with a short video, um, RTV Slovenia created an, um, an animated character to present uh, the project. So basically what I just told you in, in approximately 40 minutes, she will tell you in three minutes. So if you want a, a short recap, uh, you can watch the video. And then um, you can download, uh, although I would not recommend uh, to download there all the materials uh, from uh, from the course because if I, I it's it's a couple of, of uh, I think it's seven or eight hundred megabytes uh, if you want or even more uh, if you want to download all the materials um, but since it's modular as I explained you can choose from any uh, module that you want to focus on let's say uh, screen AD and then it takes you to a next page with an introductory video telling you uh, what the module uh, encompasses and then you can go to um, module two where uh, you can see all the different um, units in the module so you can choose to download for example um, something on film and genres you can decide to um, download the unit on, on software um, on language use on film language for example and if you take um, if you go into the unit you can even go uh, a level uh, lower download the core video so with the basic uh, materials basic information you can go to the additional videos um, giving more concrete in-depth information uh, or you can um, download documents like uh, tasks to complete for this uh, unit for example and uh, basically uh, that's a very rapid uh, overview of the AdLab um, course materials. But I suppose, as you have seen, uh, if you want to design a course on AD or if you have designed a course on AD and you need materials for um, whatever is relevant uh, for the module that you are teaching, uh, you can find them there. And although I'm not entirely objective here, um, I found them because we had to use them this year in our online course too. Uh, very useful and students apparently also like them a lot. And now I'm going to shut up and take questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Gert. Uh, I think you answered uh, my question was if you uh, had the, or if you put the, mod, the mod different modules or the entire course into practice and what the feedback from the students were 
was, but you just, um, <clears throat> sorry, you just said that. So you had positive feedback from them. Yes, yes. Um, for various uh, reasons, um, the, the two most, uh, the, the comments that we got most uh, from our students was that they um, appreciated the fact that the videos um, were not too long. Um, because during the design um, of the course, when we were preparing, we read that usually you should try to keep your uh, videos short, not exceeding five or six minutes. So we split the, the information up in shorter videos and students like that because they said if there are longer videos, then we, try, uh, we, we, we tend to lose concentration and not pick up the last bits. So that's what they liked. And another thing um, they were very positive about is that it was not just um, us giving PowerPoint presentations, but that they also could listen uh, to experiences from, from end users or that they could see audio describers um, in their uh, professional practice. So that was two positive comments that, that came up most. Okay, thank you. Are you going to be using them again? Definitely, yes. Okay. Yes, because we'll... Even when we return back to our normal, let's say, um, on campus, um, sit on, on on campus situation, um, because the thing is, and and that's probably something that all of you um, are are confronted with. Uh, we can teach one module uh, on either audiovisual translation or audio description, and you have to cover so much. You only have so little time, and you also want your students to gain some practical experience. Um, so what we're going to do next year is uh, use the videos from the AdLab Pro project uh, as preparatory materials for the students to process at home, then have brief discussions so that in the classroom they can actually create uh, descriptions and do practical tasks. Okay, thank you. You have uh, also three more questions in the Q&A, so if you could please go there and and um, try to and answer the questions that you have. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I'm going to thank you again, and uh, we are going to move on to our next guest, um, Soledad Zarate. She's going to be talking to us about SDH training uh, and the fact that it starts with the audience. Um, very briefly, so that is a lecturer at UCL where she teaches subtitling and captioning for the deaf and hard of hearing people at a postgraduate level. She completed a PhD in translation at the University College London, focusing on subtitling for deaf children. She launched a captioning service at the Puppet Theatre Barge in London in, 19, in 2016, I'm sorry, and is currently in charge of providing captions for um, their productions throughout the year. Uh, finally, uh, Soldat is the author of a recent published um, book, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Soldat, but yes, the book captioning entitled with the title Captioning and Subtitling for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Audiences. So, thank you. So, that did I, it, it's a book, correct? I have it just the title book. and it doesn't say whether it's a book or it's an article, but it is a book, right? It's a textbook for students, you're yeah. correct. <laughs> textbook for students, okay. Thank you very much. So um, the floor is yours now, whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, just, here we are. Um, okay, so uh, I'm a white woman uh, with olive skin. Um, I have uh, dark uh, wavy hair. Uh, shoulder length and uh, today I'm wearing a uh, blouse and um, some big headphones. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. So um, I have uh, this presentation that you're going to be seeing today. Um, it's available online so uh, you can scan this uh, QR code and access it um, or else perhaps uh, the host uh, or myself later on 
can share the link uh, in the chat so everyone can have the, the slides that you will be seeing here. Um, okay, so um, when I start, when I teach uh, SDH, um, I generally like, start, uh, like uh, starting by the audience. Um, this means that uh, before even getting into discussing any of the uh, perhaps elements of SDH, um, I devote quite a lot of time to um, talking about who the end users are. Um, this is partly because I'm a hearing person and uh, I think that it takes time uh, and effort to understand the requirements of the audiences we are working for. Um, after introducing the, the audiences to the best of, of my knowledge, of course, uh, I then um, introduce elements that are specific to SDH. Generally, I teach to students who have already uh, done a module on subtitling. So, in, in a way, um, they have you know, knowledge about technical um, uh, issues of subtitling, so uh, I can um, sort of get into the SDH specific elements quite quickly at the beginning of the course. So today I will be doing pretty much <laughs> the same. Um, so um, by definition, we are subtitling for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, so here I have uh, distinguished this group into three subgroups. So we have a deaf with a lower case, and this indicates um, anyone uh, with a medical condition of deafness. Um, then we have the hard of hearing, um, who um, this is simplified, but it gives, just to give a, a sort of a general idea. Uh, hard of hearing are generally people who have some level of acquired deafness, which may be mild to moderate. Um, and they generally have speech or the main method of communication. And then uh, I'm, I'm sure that here in, uh, in this uh, conference, most people are familiar with uh, um, deaf with a capital D. So here we're talking about a linguistic and cultural uh, minority. Um, and these people have sign language generally as their main language of communication. Um, so uh, I then introduced these models of deafness or disability because in a way, uh, having an understanding of these models help towards understanding the requirements of our um, audiences. So uh, I start with the cultural model of deafness and I have a quote here by Dolnik, um, which um, says, why should anyone expect deaf people to deny their roots when every other cultural group proudly celebrates its traditions and history? Why stigmatize the speakers of a particular language as disabled? So from this quote, what we can gather is that uh, people who uh, associate with this cultural model or belong to the deaf community do not even um, call themselves or consider themselves disabled. Okay, which is a word that we, we, we hear a lot. And often I have students asking me, is this okay to use the term disabled or impairment and so on. And I think that these models um, help us in, in that uh, respect. Um, so uh, the concept of disability within the social model uh, is intended in a way that uh, disability doesn't really concern the individual, but is more of a social construct, okay? So I, I have selected a couple of quotes um, um, helpful in this respect, and this one comes from the Union of Physically Impaired Against Segregation, uh, which is a UK-based organization from the 70s. It's quite an old quote, but uh, still useful, uh, saying, what we are interested in are ways of changing our conditions of life and then overcoming the disabilities which are imposed on top of our physical impairments by the, the way this society is organized to exclude us. So <clears throat> here we can really see that impairment is something that concerns the individual and uh, disability is 
seen as something imposed by society. And uh, is further explained here. Um, this is a quote um, from uh, the preamble of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the United Nations, saying, disability results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinders their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Um, and finally, we have the normative model, model, which is the medical model of disability, um, which is the model that considers uh, the person who's deaf or have or hearing as having um, something that needs to be fixed or cured. So here are uh, some statistics. Uh, I don't really like numbers, but uh, often people ask, oh, who are we subtitling for? How many people are there who are deaf or hard of hearing? Um, so uh, I got some statistics and I make a distinction between uh, adults and children. Um, so 15% of the world's adult population has some degree of deafness. Um, one to two uh, babies in 1000 are born deaf. And by the age of 19, we have three children who are deaf. Um, uh, in 1000. So we can see that the percentage, uh, of course, increases um, with um, in the adult population. And this is due to the fact that age is one of the main uh, causes of deafness. Um, so I, I also like um, to sort of touch uh, on some aspects of deafness so that we understand that uh, this group of people, there isn't like a profile of uh, this deaf person and this is what they, they require. It's a very diverse group. Uh, so by touching on to these aspects, I hope that um, to convey to my students that uh, this is the case where uh, there isn't such, there isn't a thing like just one profile. And although we're going to produce one subtitle file, I think it's important to understand the diversity of this group. So um, uh, deafness, deafness is classified in uh, four degrees, depending on the loudness of the quietest um, uh, sound heard. So here we have mild, moderate, severe, and profound deafness, and uh, some basic implications, okay? Which again, can be read a bit like generalizations, but just to give you an idea, um, somebody who, is, uh, who has a mild or moderate deafness is very unlikely, well, is, is not going to have a cochlear implant, for example. Uh, somebody with severe profound uh, deafness is more likely to have a cochlear implant. And why is it important to understand this? Uh, because uh, depending on, on, on what device uh, you're using, uh, you might encounter different difficulties and so on. Um, or another, for example, misconception could be that if you are profoundly deaf, then you're a signer, and that's not always the case. Um, you know, you might have the spoken language as the main language and so on, but these are just so that to create a, a general, to get a general idea. Uh, so I talked about the degrees of deafness, and now I'm talking about frequency. Um, Frequency um, means that uh, frequency is an imp another important aspect because you might come across um, deaf people who have a high frequency deafness, uh, meaning that perhaps they find it um, difficult to hear uh, children's voices or singing of birds, for example, uh, or somebody might have a low frequency deafness, meaning that they find uh, they, they don't really hear uh, or they have limited access, more limited access to deep voices, for example, uh, and so on. And uh, of course, we have two types of, of deafness. So conductive or sensory neural. Um, the main uh, differences are that uh, conductive deafness is a sort of mechanical deafness that affects the middle ear, so where the eardrum is. Uh, and this deafness, the, the, um, the characteristic is that it's generally temporary, okay? So it's not irreversible. And it generally affects the loudness of the sound. 
Um, sensory neural deafness is different because it affects the inner ear, so where we have the cochlear and the auditory nerve, and, um, and, and it's irreversible. And, um, and it generally affects the uh, quality of the sound. So uh, the devices that uh, the um, deaf and hard of hearing people may uh, be using are the hearing aid, um, which works uh, exactly as, well, not exactly, but similarly to an amplifier. So whatever residual hearing the person has uh, through the hearing aid, the sound is amplified. And, and, and so more, there is more access to sound in a way. And when we talk about uh, cochlear implants, uh, for example, as I explained, this has been um, done through surgery. So um, generally uh, people who are eligible are the severely or profoundly deaf people, um, not those with mild or moderate deafness because they have uh, more residual hearing and the cochlear implant basically destroys that residual hearing that the uh, person may have. Um, so uh, here is some data that I find quite interesting, which is that 5% uh, of the eligible deaf adults receive cochlear implant in the UK, um, whereas 94 of eligible children aged 17 and under receive uh, cochlear implants in the UK. Um, uh, in terms of children, um, all my data, because I'm based in the UK, uh, is, is is generally UK based, although uh, I think that um, quite a lot of this data is sort of transferable to other countries as well. Um, so in the UK, uh, there are 22% of deaf children who have profound or severe deafness and 10% uh, of deaf children are implanted, okay? Um, so, I tend to uh, speak about children because, well, I my in, originally, initially, my research was on deaf children, and my interest um, uh, was on deaf children, uh, still is. So um, I think that they are uh, different, uh, as we have uh, also heard from other speakers earlier on. There are different sort of strategies or ways of translating depending on, on your audience. Um, so that's why I like to uh, speak about this group of people and think of uh, how do we subtitle for them uh, in a different way from adults. Um, even though this may not be uh, how it's, it's done in, on broadcast, for example, okay? Um, so uh, I've already, I think I've already said that 22% of deaf children are either profoundly or severely deaf. And so we have nearly 60% of deaf children who have a mild or moderate deafness. Um, what happens? I think it's important to know what happens. How do they learn the language? Um, how do they communicate, okay? Because when we talk about subtitling for hearing viewers, we always talk about oh, what's the first language, what's the second language, okay? And so we might come across most of deaf children who have the spoken language as their first language, but this needs to be treated in a different way somehow. So let's see what happens to them when they go to school. They generally go to a mainstream school, Okay, so we have about 84% of deaf children going to a mainstream school. In these mainstream schools, there is like maybe, I think it's 6% of them, there is some sort of uh, provision, like some sort of unit where the children can, uh, that the children can attend um, during the day, going out from the classroom and going back into their classroom, depending on their requirements. So there may be some sort of extra support in a way. But uh, what this indicates is they are exposed to the spoken language and they are taught in a spoken language, okay? The majority. Then we do have a small percentage of uh, children who go to schools for the deaf, but it's only 3%. Um, and, uh, and, they, and these schools, they do use the bilingual form of communication, so sign language as well as the spoken language. And then we have special schools 
Okay, and these special schools uh, are basically children that have also like additional uh, health, social or educational requirements. Okay, so not just uh, deaf children. So um, this sort of matches what happens in the, in the school system, right? Uh, in the educational system, because we can see that 87% of deaf children have the spoken language as their main language. Um, there is a percentage, I think, of 8% which have the spoken language with some sort of signed uh, support, which doesn't necessarily mean sign language, although it could include it. Um, and then I've, I, I was interested in seeing, okay, so what happens when they are severely and profoundly deaf as opposed to uh, have a mild or moderate deafness? Uh, and this is what happens. So uh, they still have the spoken language as their main language because we have 67%, but it's a bit of a lower percentage, but it's still the majority. And then 21% spoken language with some sort of sign support. And this concerns specifically the group of severely and profoundly deaf children. So uh, to sum up, I think important things to bear in mind uh, when subtitling for um, young audiences. Um, so uh, of course, it's, um, it's important to, to know uh, you know, one of the main uh, things to, to, to bear in mind is that a child can be prelingually or postlingually deaf. And this, of course, has very different implications because one thing is um, becoming deaf after having acquired some uh, level of uh, literacy or like language or reading or writing. And it's different if I haven't acquired that yet and uh, I'm learning a language uh, with limited uh, access to uh, the auditory channel, limited, or yes, limited, I would, I would say. An important uh, piece of information is that 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents. So this means that only 10% of deaf children have uh, parents who are deaf and are therefore exposed to sign language, okay? So the majority are exposed to uh, um, a spoken language. Um, and uh, yes, so this gives you a bit, although I did say that, you know, this is a very di diverse group, this sort of information I hope gives you a bit like an idea of what the profile of the deaf child is, okay? Um, I, I did want to uh, show you uh, when, when we spoke about uh, hearing uh, devices, so uh, hearing aid and a cochlear implant, um, what it is like to have a hearing um, aid and what it is like to have a, a cochlear implant. Um, and so, but you can access this um, presentation and, and, and click on the link and, um, and, and have an experience of a sort of simulation or what it's like to hear through both devices. Um, Right, so uh, I'm sure that most of you are familiar um, with uh, these four um, communicative uh, dimensions, let's call them, uh, because they are uh, taken from Gottlieb and the La Bastita, but I find it quite useful when I start teaching to, um, in, to show my, my students, okay, what is it that we're going to be working on? Um, the, mm, and what have you already worked on before coming to this class? So generally they would have done subtitling. So they would have done, uh, so here we are, have the verbal auditory elements. So dialogue, they might have dealt with certainly dialogues and lyrics in their subtitling classes prior to coming to see me. And then obviously the focus of my classes uh, besides the dialogues and lyrics are on nonverbal auditory elements. So music, sound effects, paralinguistic features, and speakers identification. So um, I generally get, give an overview of these elements um, quite um, soon in the classes so they can start working on, on the tasks. And then as the classes progress, uh, it, we get more into depth into um, these elements um, that, that I am. Um, I've got here. So, but before we get into specific SDH elements, uh, in terms of dialogues, a few things to bear in mind. Um, because um, uh, SDH is uh, 
mostly, not only, um, an intralingual practice, uh, there is an issue which you probably have already read and heard about it, which is the verbatim versus edited issue. This is mainly because it's a, an intralingual practice, mostly, um, and, uh, and, and also because there is a social sort of issue there, like there is a group of people who want the same access as hearing audiences. So we have these two aspects. So I would say the factors to consider when we are dealing with subtitling dialogues is that um, most deaf people uh, have some access to sound, okay? So uh, the idea that deaf people cannot hear at all is, is actually quite wrong because most people will have limited but some access to sound. So what happens is that sometimes, uh, from my experience, um, an accurate transcription or what is in the in the source text may be easier to follow than an edited, even if it's got a, a higher uh, reading uh, speed, uh, it's still easier to follow than edited text because there is a sort of match between what can be heard and what can be seen, read, okay? So this is something to bear in mind. Um, Obviously, if the speech rate is high, you know, editing is uh, unavoidable. Um, obviously, the complexity of, of the lexis and the syntax will dictate also our choices about having perhaps a, a, a lower reading speed. Uh, if there is a program that has a lot of uh, visual information, like, I don't know, an action film, this is also to bear in mind. And of course, as, as I mentioned earlier on the, the age group. So generally I say uh, in editing, of course, but stay as close as possible to the original text. And, uh, and also, uh, of course, like all those um, features that are typical of oral speech, uh, we treat them in a similar way as we do in subtitling, but sometimes careful that those may be uh, obviously may help with characterization or, you know, may have a diegetic value. Um, when it comes to children's programs in terms of dialogues, um, a couple of things I want to mention here. Um, one is that there are programs that uh, are uh, aimed at really young children and they use a lot of narration. That's the sort of format. And sometimes I think it's, um, it's easier to uh, subtitle the narration in the form of dialogue exchanges because it helps to simplify the language um, and, uh, and, and to lower also the uh, reading speed. Uh, when it comes to preschool programs that they are at, here in the UK are subtitled as if they were for an adult audience, um, I think it would be interesting um, to look at uh, perhaps how the subtitles could be used in a more sort of didactic way and have, um, for example, a single word, okay? A single word that uh, the, the child might not be able to read, but uh, might be able to recognize by shape and sight and associated to that object. So perhaps the subtitles could be used in, in that way. And redundancy here, I intend redundancy as in having in, uh, in the subtitle something that is already visually available or perhaps, uh, perhaps even textual repetition. And I think that these are important So uh, when it comes to uh, subtitling for uh, young viewers. Uh, for the same funk, for the same sort of uh, didactic role that subtitles can have. Um, in terms of lyrics, they are normally treated as poetry. Uh, there is more flexibility in the display rate and duration uh, because rhythm may be more important than the content. Of course, uh, this may be different in a case where the song was made for that program and is about the content of the actual song. Uh, okay, this, is, this will depend on, on the program in question. This is an example of how I subtitle lyrics. Uh, I think there is a lot of stylistic variation about how things are done. So although to my students, I, I do say, um, this is the brief and I would like to use these conventions. Uh, I focus more on the content, if you like, on, on discussing the content of the subtitles rather than the stylistic um, 
guidelines. But this is how I would subtitle an example of how we subtitle the lyrics. So the quaver in the first line that contains lyrics and the closing quaver in the last line of lyrics. Um, I'm just check, quickly checking the time. Uh, I think I'm still okay. So in terms of music, um, music, you know, maybe not anymore. And I hear, you know, a lot of, you know, we have seen Elena Di Giovanni's presentation earlier where she showed us that clip of, uh, uh, was it La, La Donna Immobile the, of Rigoletto? And we, you know, we look at forms of immersive theater and opera and so on. So maybe, no, not among us or not, but there is a sort of misconception that there can be this misconception that deaf people do not enjoy music or do, whereas of course we have, you know, uh, dancers who are uh, prelingually, profoundly deaf, congenitally deaf, and there are dancers. Uh, we have musicians. So I've got a couple of examples here that you are welcome to explore if you have an interest, percussionist and composer deaf, and you know uh, they are different. So I think showing examples of of, of deaf people who uh, you know are musicians or dancers and so on can be uh, quite helpful because perhaps for a hearing person it can be quite uh, strange. Well, I have come across students that are quite surprised that we do need to subtitle uh, music. Uh, the limitation, and this, this is nice uh, that I can mention it here, the limitation for me with music is that um, sometimes uh, I might choose not to subtitle the music. And, and this is because um, I sometimes feel that the textual representation as is written of music doesn't really do it justice. So sometimes I think, oh, uh, I'm talking now about captioning in the, in the puppet theater. Sometimes there is um, music uh, which is there. And I just think, do I really want my audience to look at this subtitle, which is going to say uh, mellow, I don't know, piano music, or, or do I actually want them to not take their eyes off the stage because they will get that same mood from looking at the actions and so on. Of course, if we have other possibilities of conveying the music, which we do, like assistive uh, tactile technology, uh, for example, in Spain, there was uh, caption performances with a vibrating backpack so that uh, audiences can feel the vibration, then perhaps the subtitling choices uh, would be different. Um, also, we have sound waves, which we're all familiar with, like video programs and editing programs, animated graphical uh, score, and so on. Um, so uh, I always say to my students, less is more, because we, I think, have a tendency all to subtitle more than we need to. So there is this sort of idea that everything that is in the soundtrack needs to be subtitled, whereas I think that uh, these elements need to be uh, prioritized. What is what needs to be subtitled and what doesn't need to be subtitled. I always say if there is a change, because we have a tendency to have to reassure our audiences and saying the music continues and this continues and and this can be quite uh, tiring for the tiring and also instead of uh, helping to the viewers to enjoy the program, uh, it has the opposite effect. So I always say less is more, and, uh, but elements that we might include in the music are listed here, title, artist, genre, mood, instruments, and what you include is not uh, as much as I can, is what is relevant in that particular situation. So, oh yeah, I did have mellow piano music here, um, jazzy, upbeat music. And uh, for example, the last subtitle is from, the, from a school of rock, which is a film about uh, rock music. So of course I'm going to have the title and the artist. So this is just an example. Sound effects, again, uh, not all sound effects need to be subtitled. Again, always less is more. Um, so subtitle those that have storytelling value. Um, so um, here there is, uh, there is 
a video of, uh, of Bambi actually from 1942, believe it or not, that you can access later on if you're interested, where there is a gunshot which is off screen. So Bambi and the mother are running and the hunters are after them. And then we hear a gunshot. And, and then we see Bambi on his own. And, and so if we don't subtitle that gunshot, that is pretty crucial. But uh, uh, yes, but not all sounds need to be subtitled, which again, in my students, I find this a tendency to subtitle every sound, okay? They can be heard. There is a bird which was just there for um, sort of ambience and, and there is a subtitle. So I'm, I'm asking my viewers to read that subtitle, which is not important. Uh, examples of sound effects are here, like door creaks, footsteps, beep beep. If it's uh, for children, I tend to use onomatopoeias. Uh, paralinguistic features. Um, so these include accents, pronunciation, intonation, or even laughter, price, etc. Um, you might use a label, uh, or sometimes an orthographic transcription of the sound may be more suitable. Um, examples of uh, intonation. So how do you convey intonation through the subtitle in a textual way? And so generally is uppercase. So the word that is emphasized is an uppercase or you may have a label in capital letters saying shouts or whispers and, and so on. Um, sarcasm and uh, sarcasm, I always tell my students that uh, instead of adding all these symbols, brackets and exclamation and question marks for sarcasm, I often say, just think about whether this is already conveyed through the content, okay? Or visually, rather than having uh, subtitles that uh, can appear to the eye um, quite messy. And other voice qualifiers that may be required if they're not visually conveyed, like, Abruptly, this is my example, excuse me, if it's not visually conveyed, I might want to add a paralinguistic uh, feature subtitle. Um, and uh, well, the same with laughter and crying, etc. Uh, so a label within uh, brackets. Um, and well, pauses and hesitations are generally conveyed through the timing of the subtitle, of course, although sometimes we may use punctuation as well. And again, stylistic guidelines vary. Uh, so for example, when a subtitle finishes and there is an interruption or a pause, okay, you have the three dots and then the next subtitle, you may have two dots at the beginning. But I think that, um, uh, yes, I think that pauses and hesitations are, you know, normally, basically convey through punctuation and, and, and timing. Sometimes you may use uh, like um, in, in this uh, last example, uh, I would like to say that because it's, uh, and you need to indicate that if it's, if it's meaningful, if it's uh, something that um, needs to be uh, subtitled. Um, in terms of speaker's identification, um, so yes, on broadcast, we use colors, etc. But again, um, just uh, if I if I tell my students, okay, I like you to subtitle this clip and use this sort of way of identifying speakers and explain um, what it is. So it might be a descriptive label or a nominative label, depending. And of course, these labels are only used if. Uh, if it's not clear who is speaking, not all the time, because this would affect, of course, the, um, the reading speed. Um, and whereas colors, generally the rule is that you allocate the color to one character and it stays the same, whether you can see the character on screen or not, you always use the same color. And of course, dashes or hyphens. Now, uh, the last thing I want to, I, I think it is the last thing, uh, is this. Um, uh, these creative solutions, because we were talking earlier, I know um, Alina mentioned quite a lot, uh, tool developers and what is it that we would need and, and so on. So I think that I find myself using, um, for captioning in the theater, using software, which is not subtitling software, uh, which is a PowerPoint or Keynote for Apple users, uh, so that I can introduce um, uh, features that I want to experiment with. So uh, for example, here we have uh, the drums. 
So this first example shows the drums and some musical notes and uh, three dots, okay? And this is um, a drum roll. So it's in a puppet show, uh, which is for young children. And I'm trying to find ways of conveying the, that, you know, through in a visual way. And, and this is something that uh, taking software uh, doesn't allow you to do. So I end up using uh, PowerPoint. And as you can imagine, it's uh, terribly time consuming because uh, it's, yes, it's just impossible. But uh, uh, it would be nice to be able to have subtitling or captioning software. And if there is already, and I'm completely unaware of it, please do let me know uh, where you can insert pictures, okay? Uh, not just symbols, uh, smileys, but actual images. Because what I'm doing here is I'm taking pictures from the actual show and, uh, and using those icons, uh, for example, to indicate where the source of the sound is coming from. Okay, here's a clock. So the image of the clock would tick tock, or uh, this is like town mouse and country mouse in the third example. Who, uh, the, what, the mouse is whistling, so I have the image of, of the mouse and then the subtitle says whistles or for speaker identification. So uh, there is a fox, so the first line shows the picture of the fox and then there is the answer from the lion, so the picture of the lion and, and so on. Um, uh, well, th this is me, I'm, I'd be happy to done so I'd be happy to answer any questions or um, uh, discuss further any of the aspects that uh, I, I discussed today. Uh, I have a, a Facebook group uh, which is on SDH and captioning um, that you can uh, um, access if you like uh, to join uh, the conversation. Anyone can can write and, and, and get feedback, etc. And, um, and then I have the book that uh, Sandra was mentioning, which was published at the beginning of this year, and, um, and it's open access and is specifically written for, for students. So um, I hope you, you find this uh, useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sola, for the interesting and um, I'm kind of speechless in terms of this uh, um, presentation. It was wonderful. Thank you so very much. Um, also, I would ask you to please look at the question and answers. I think there is uh, one um, question for you. Yes, about, um, about your presentation. Also, um, so we can, I have just, just a small question. We can download your book from the link that you, you have in your presentation. I don't know. No, yes, so um, we'll be having uh, access to the presentation or could you perhaps uh, share the link in uh, um, the... Yes, so the link of, the okay. So I'm going to share uh, the... Um, so do you want the link to the book or the whole presentation? Because it's think, online. No, the, the link to the chat, I think, would be the, the link. Sorry, the link to the book. If you okay. could leave it in the chat, I think that would be interesting. Yeah. Okay, I will do that. For the presentation, then I think that will be up to Emilia and Nicola. I don't know what they want to do with the presentation. So we haven't decided yet. So it's okay. Okay, that's fine. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, we still have one minute for questions, if anyone would like to, to ask. No questions? Okay, if there are no, well, there is one question in the Q&A, but um, then we, let's move on um, to our last presentation, which um, is about the human-centric workflows for live subtitling via speech recognition. Um, and this uh, presentation, I believe, will be given to us by two people, Annalisa San Sandrelli uh, from uh, University in Roma, in Rome, and Elena Davidi from the University of Surrey. Um, so I'm just going to present the worker, the just a minute. I 
I apologize, my, my computer is blocked. It's some doing some update or something and it's completely blocked. But hopefully- Don't you worry, if you prefer, we can introduce ourselves so we don't keep anybody waiting. It's not a problem. We're not especially keen on formalities, neither Elena or myself. <laughs> so it's not a problem at all, Sandra. Really? But I'm sorry because I can't, I can't. No worries, no worries. My if computer's I, been playing up all day, so I, I fully I understand. I can't move <laughs> anything in my computer at the moment. <laughs> sorry to hear that. Don't worry about it. No, I hope it. it's <laughs> kind of fired, I think. But if, <laughs> then I would ask you um, if you could please um, talk to us a little bit about yourselves. Okay? Yes. Thank okay, you, we'll do that then. Okay, no problem. Right, so first of all, I'll, uh, I'm Annalisa Sandrelli. I'm an, an Italian white woman in my late 40s, very late 40s, in fact, but I will not, I will use this opportunity until my birthday. So I'm in my very late 40s and I will not admit to anything else happening this year. Uh, apart from that, I have brown eyes and long brown straight hair. I'm quite small, about five foot three, but it doesn't matter because I'm sitting down at the minute. And I'm wearing a black t-shirt with a picture by an Icelandic artist called Olafur Eliasson, which I bought at a lovely Tate Modern last time I was in London before the pandemic and all this mess. Um, apart from that, I'll be sharing the presentation with uh, Elena Davitti, who will introduce herself and will uh, tell you what she looks like. Uh, to put it shortly, uh, she's also she also has brown hair and dark eyes, but she's much taller and much thinner, and she's much younger. <laughs> but she'll give you all the details later. And apart from that, in terms of uh, our backgrounds, I'm a, a, a lecturer in interpreting and re-speaking at Unint University in Rome, which is one of the co-organizers of the event. And hopefully we are going to organize one of the events in the near future for the uh, uh, summer um, audiovisual translation summer, uh, summer school. Uh, I've been teaching for over 25 years and I've taught in Trieste, in Forli, and also uh, for about six years in the UK at the University of Hull. My main research interests are, of course, audiovisual translation, but because of my background and my teaching, also interpreting and all those um, kind of uh, points where all these disciplines cross, which is why in the last few years I have taken an interest both as a practitioner, but especially as a researcher in re-speaking. So um, perhaps this is a good time to start the presentation if Elena could share it with you. I warn you, my computer, my internet connection has been playing up all day. So I hope I will not die on you. But if I do, uh, Elena will be there to pick up the pieces. And this is one of the advantages of doing a presentation, you know, sharing it with somebody else. So um, as Sandra was saying, our presentation is about interlingual re-speaking. Uh, so the first thing we're going to be doing is to give you an introduction to what re-speaking actually is in its intralingual variety first and then interlingual. And we're doing, we're doing that because it is not yet an established discipline and not too many people know very much about it. And then we're going to focus on interlingual re-speaking uh, specifically. So I'll tell you a bit about the research that has been carried out in this field, not just by us, but by other researchers as well. And then I'll pass on the floor to Elena, who will describe the SMART project, which is uh, a project funded by a UK funding body um, in which Elena is the lead investigator and I'm one of the uh, international core investigators and there's a lot of other people involved. Uh, Elena has a nice slide to introduce everyone. Uh, and finally, some conclusions and implications for training. Uh, should any of you be interested in introducing re-speaking into your own programs? Here we go. So, um, the, uh, of course, as a basic, uh, as a background, uh, you have to you know, we are all aware of the fact that technology is playing an ever-growing role in translation and interpreting, and especially in audiovisual translation. We've been hearing all day, you know, presentations from people who talk about different software, about uh, the use of uh, cloud technology, etc. And one aspect that I think has emerged quite clearly is that uh, it's important for translators, interpreters, and academia, for trainers, 
to interact with um, the software industry to make sure that they develop the tools that we need so that not only do they meet professional standards, but can also be easily applied to an educational setting, which is sometimes hard to do. Um, and it's important for our uh, trainees, for our students, to learn to adapt and adjust to uh, you know, all these new changes to ensure that they know what's available and they can actually harness state-of-the-art technologies to their advantage rather than risk being replaced by technology. You know, we are, I'm sure all of you are asked by your students some, you know, sooner or later in the program, whether there's actually going to be any jobs left for them because of the uh, pervasive nature of, you know, machine translation, memory to memory tools, automatic transcription and all that. Um, so, in other words, what we're saying is that developments must be technology based, not technology driven. So it's useful to uh, know what technology is able to do at the moment and where it is working towards in the near future. But uh, just because something is possible, it's not necessarily useful. So we need to interact with industry to tell us what we need. And this means collaborating in shaping responsible human machine interaction workflows. In this particular um, um, it, in, in this regard, it is especially uh, interesting to see what has been happening in speech recognition technology, which has made huge progress in the last few years and has made it possible to develop different workflows for real-time speech-to-text, both within the same language and across languages. And this is essentially what we're talking about today. We are focusing on hybrid workflows hybrid meaning involving both software and, uh, and the human component, and also hybrid because they are at a crossroads between translation and interpreting, um, involving re-speaking as a method for live subtitling, for uh, providing subtitles uh, for the benefit of uh, those who are sensory impaired, but also across different languages, and in real time, which has not always been uh, easy in the past. So uh, some definitions, intralingual re-speaking, also known in the US, you might have heard uh, refer to it as real-time voice writing. It's, it's a technique in which a re-speaker listens to the original sound of a, a program, a TV program or a live event, such as a conference and re-speaks it, which means uh, repeats it, but adds punctuation marks orally. You need to verbalize your punctuation marks because they're not added automatically. And if they are intralingual uh, subtitles aimed at the deaf and hard of hearing audience, you also add some specific features to enable them to, uh, for example, to um, recognize different speakers, to attribute uh, the correct statement to the correct speaker. And you, you do this, you repeat this to a speech recognition software, which turns uh, your utterances into a transcript. It turns it into subtitles that are displayed on the screen with the shortest possible delay. Of course, there is some delay. Some of it is caused by the human, the speaker, and some of it is caused by the software, which takes a bit of time to process the input. Interlingual speaking is basically the same thing, but you also add a translation component. So in essence, it is simultaneous interpreting, but uh, you have to add punctuation and those features that I mentioned, such as Pika tags and things like that. So the output is not uh, a spoken version of a speech in another language as would be the case in simultaneous interpreting, it is a set of subtitles in another language. So it's essentially real-time speech to text in one language or across languages. Um, as I said before, this is not an established practice. Um, intralingual re-speaking has been going on for quite quite some time, especially in some countries. The UK uh, is one of the pioneers of this technique. Uh, so in the UK, it's been going on for at least 15 years, roughly. Um, and it was 
uh, first developed in broadcast media for television, essentially. But it is also available in live events, such as conferences, lectures, press conferences, and so on. And uh, so depending on the event, you might have to deal with monologic talk or dialogic talk. So you might be subtitling a conference given by a speaker, a monologue, or a news program with just one um, newsreader speaking, or a sports commentary, uh, a lecture, etc. Or you might be uh, subtitling an interview with two or more people. You might be subtitling a talk show, a question and answer session, and so on. So depending on the type of talk, you might be faced with uh, different challenges. If you have multiple speakers, you need to add speaker ident identification tags. Uh, there might be cases in which these different speakers uh, overlap with their voices. Um, of course, depending on the type of event, you might have both native and non-native speakers talking. They might be speaking at different speeds. And of course, uh, the range of topics that potentially you might be required to, to subtitle uh, is enormous. Could be anything really from a very general to uh, extremely technical. Uh, just by way of example, uh, in terms of speed, uh, Romero Fresco, Pablo Romero Fresco carried out a study about 10 years ago on uh, the differences in speech rates for different TV genres in the UK uh, setting. And he found that the sports programs were the slowest with about 160 words per minute. Um, but the weather reports went up to about 230 words per minute. And just to give you some comparison, uh, for interpreting purposes, a comfortable speed for an interpreter to translate simultaneously is considered to be between 120 and 140 words per minute. So it means that on television, basically everybody speaks far too fast. Um, who is it aimed for? Intralingual re-speaking is aimed primarily at those with sensory disabilities, deaf and hard of hearing. But of course, intralingual subtitles can be useful to a lot of other people as well, to uh, foreign language learners, to immigrants, or just to anybody who might want to read the subtitles as you watch a program for whatever reason. So access for all, essentially. Um, there's a lot of variability in how you set up such services, how you provide them as well. Um, First of all, the re-speaking might be performed just by one person, the so-called mono model, or by two people working in teams, like interpreters do, taking it in turns, or a multi-model with people taking on different uh, tasks. So somebody might be re-speaking, uh, somebody else might be editing the output and correcting any mistakes, somebody else might be projecting the subtitles. Uh, it really depends how you set it up and the needs of the client. You might be providing the service on site or in a proximal setting, meaning roughly in the same place, in the same building, but not necessarily in the same conference hall, for example. Or you might be doing it remotely or, as is likely to uh, happen more and more in the future, in a hybrid fashion, because now we're all used to uh, webinars and we, we demand uh, streamed events, but at the same time, there might be people uh, who want to actually go to the uh, conference in person. So you might have both uh, sets of, um, you know, situations. Um, and the, uh, the output might be actual subtitles. So one or two lines, as we are all used to seeing, or it might be several lines of scrolling text if, for example, they are projected on a separate screen, so you have much more space. They could be projected uh, simply uh, overlaid on the top of uh, PowerPoint slides, in, in which case you only have very limited space, or they could be projected on a separate screen altogether. Or they might be relayed to uh, users' personal devices, their smartphones, for example, if they are broadcast via uh, the internet. Um, so you might be dealing, you as a re-speaker might be dealing uh, with a speech only or with a multimodal presentation with graphics, with videos, with slides, etc. So all of these variables, of course, mean that uh, the requirements uh, vary enormously in different situations. And there's no standards because it's such a, a recent practice. Yep. So just to give you an example, uh, Elena is going to play a very short clip. 
to show you what intralingual re-speaking on television looks like. Michael. A nationwide general strike in Greece is expected to ground flights, comma, shut down schools. This is the seventh general strike that Greece has had in the past year, and it has been 12 months of austerity, full stop. Okay, so you might have heard that this, the re-speaker is speaking with a slightly robotic intonation, and you might have noticed that he uh, verbalized, he uttered comma and full stop. He added the punctuation marks. And then the following slide shows you a setup in a conference setting. There's no uh, video clip here. It's just to show you uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, speaker who is giving a presentation. It's a PowerPoint slide. And at the very bottom, uh, the letters in white display three lines of subtitles that were produced via the re-speaker. And you can see the re-speaker on the right-hand side in an interpreting booth, essentially, and she was working on her, on her computer and her subtitles were being uh, relayed to the big screen in the conference hall via software called Text on Top. Next slide, please. Uh, you, I think we can skip this because we've already heard it. Yeah, thank you. So you might have noticed that there's quite a few, uh, quite a lot of similarities between simultaneous interpreting and re-speaking in terms of uh, preparation. Uh, so what happens before a task, but also uh, in terms of the process. So in terms of uh, pre-task activities, of course, you have to carry out lots of terminological and content preparation, depending on the brief. Uh, the main difference is that in re-speaking, it's not just the human preparation we're talking about. You also need to add new words, new terms and proper names to the speech recognition vocabulary, because otherwise it might not recognize them. If they're outside the vocabulary, it will struggle. And uh, you also create macros. Uh, mac a macro is a voice command that makes it um, that basically creates a shortcut to transcribe very frequent items, such as the name of uh, the long name of an organization is a, a typical example. During the task, you are performing very similar multitasking um, activities, uh, above all, simultaneous listening and speaking with some decalage, some time delay. You use um, uh, your memory, of course, there's a memory effort involved, message processing, you have to chunk the message to produce meaningful re-speaking units. You need to be concise and clear. Uh, so you're essentially listening, understanding, memorizing, and reformulating at the same time. But there's also differences. The main difference is that the text that you produce is not aimed at people, it is aimed at the software. So you're producing an intermediary, uh, intermediary spoken text that will be transcribed by the software and therefore needs to contain punctuation marks, needs to be clear. Uh, that's why the re-speaker was speaking so robotically because you can't use intonation. Uh, the software does not understand prosody. Um, and therefore multitasking is more complex. You have your listening, comprehension, memory, speaking, but also watching, reading, and sometimes typing, because if you spot an error in the transcript, you correct it manually. And so split attention is, uh, you know, is to a higher factor in re-speaking. So the key, uh, the key challenges, I've already said it, is multitasking, basically, and split attention. Dictation, you must learn, or, or rather, you must unlearn to speak naturally, because you must learn to speak robotically. You must find the right speed. You must chunk the text into units because, as I was saying, the software needs to process the message and uh, takes a while to display the output. So if you speak like a simultaneous interpreter normally does, i.e. very fast without any pauses in between, the software doesn't have a chance of displaying you the output of recognition. So you need to insert some pauses here and there, um, otherwise, um, you might have basically nothing appearing on the screen for too many seconds and then a whole block of text appearing at the very end, which is not uh, useful for your users. Then adding oral punctuation is hard because it's unnatural, but it's also hard because whilst you're re-speaking, you must try and visualize 
your sentences as written text. And of course, we know that spoken language and written language do not always follow the same rules. So you need to decide where you need some punctuation. You need to decide where how to segment your text. All of this means that you are forced to reduce the text to prevent the subtitles from lagging behind too much. Now, of course, some text reduction is inherent in all forms of subtitling, but it is even more marked in live subtitling. Next slide, please. So why do we uh, need to reduce the text? Well, essentially because people speak faster than subtitle users can read. So you can't transcribe absolutely everything because otherwise the users will not be able to keep up with reading. And you wouldn't be able to do it anyway because you have to bear in mind that when you are verbalizing punctuation marks, you're essentially producing more words than the original speaker. So you must save time somewhere, otherwise your, um, your subtitles lag behind too much. All of this means that in re-speaking, um, basically most re-spoken subtitles are edited. Um, they're almost never verbatim unless the original speaker speaks very, very slow. Um, of course, spontaneous speech does not always lend itself well to transcription. If you are transcribing a speech from the European Parliament, you probably, um, you probably don't find it too hard because those speakers tend to construct their sentences very neatly, you know, correct grammar and everything. But you are, if you are transcribing uh, a spontaneous interview in the street, you probably find yourself with, um, you know, broken sentences and bits of unfinished phrases. And therefore, you need to correct the syntax a bit, because otherwise, the users will not understand what the speaker is saying. You tend to edit out, you tend to delete any redundancies, any repetitions, uh, conversation markers, anything superfluous. Um, and of course, in interlingual speaking, you probably tend to do it even more, because the translation component further adds to your delay, because it takes longer to uh, you know, to think of a correct translation. Yep. So is it feasible? I mean, can anybody actually do it? Well, there's not that many studies on this very recent practice. And I'm sorry, I have to quote myself because I'm one of the few people who has written something about it, but I will not quote just myself. There's other studies as well. Uh, very briefly, I uh, published a paper in uh, Intralinea, an online translation journal that compares simultaneous interpreting and interlingual speaking services in the same conference to try and see whether in terms of accuracy and in terms of uh, actual content, whether the audience uh, who were relying on the subtitles received roughly the same um, information as those relying on simultaneous interpreting. And interestingly, uh, the results was uh, were that um, there was no significant uh, difference in terms of uh, meaning distortion in terms of actual translation errors, but there was certainly greater information loss in the subtitles, especially through omissions. And the results also point to the fact that specific training is needed for re-speakers to deal with live conferences with emphasis on the multimedia nature of text. Basically, if information is available in the slides as well, you do not need to repeat it in the subtitles because it's a waste of time. So you need to be able to exploit the PowerPoint presentation to your advantage. Um, another study that was published this year uh, applied the NTR model to the live subtitles produced in the same conference. The NTR model is uh, a model for the assessment of accuracy of interlingual live subtitles. Um, I applied it to six speeches from that conference, about 90 minutes of material. Um, I can say, well, the, 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 let's say that the industry uh, quality threshold that's been indicated for intralingual is uh, an NTR score of 98%. And in this conference, uh, it was never achieved. The average was about 94, 94 point something. And the most frequent errors were uh, omissions and some, some, some substitutions. So once again, the fact that the most frequent error was omissions points to the fact that you need specific training to promote successful editing without information loss, training people to 
say things concisely. Something I'll probably benefit from as well because I need to speed this up to pass the uh, floor to Elena. Um, a number of very interesting experimental studies were carried out in Poland by a research team. You see here the names. I'm not going to even try and attempt reading them because I, I will certainly it sound terrible. Um, but um, they were very interesting because they carried out lots of different experiments on professional and trainee interpreters, translators, and a control group of uh, bilinguals with no translation or interpreting ex experience. Um, they identified some problem triggers in re-speaking, namely very slow or very fast speakers, um, overlapping uh, speakers, figures and proper nouns, and this is similar to interpreting, certain linguistic features such as complex syntax or wordplay, and of course, in interlingual re-speaking, some problems were caused by translation. Um, interestingly for us, for what Elena will tell you uh, in a minute, is the fact that the interpreters obtain the highest accuracy scores and also the lowest text reduction scores, which seems to indicate that interpreters have a comparative advantage over translators and bilinguals with no experience in acquiring this skill. Next slide, please. So uh, another two experimental studies, ILSA that was mentioned by someone else before, maybe Gert, uh, I forget now. Uh, it's um, an interlingual live subtitling for access course. It's a project uh, that just finished last year, funded by the uh, European Union. And it was essentially a four week course online. Um, and the final tests were analyzed with the NTR model. The participants were all trainees with uh, different backgrounds in interpreting, consecutive, simultaneous, in subtitling, respeaking, and bilinguals. Um, and then a similar uh, or at least on, on the face of it, it looks similar, experiment was carried out by the pilot for the SMART project, which uh, recruited trainees with similar backgrounds as ILSA, but instead of uh, actually training them in interlingual speaking, we only provided an eight hour crash course. So literally in, on the same day, they learned to do a bit of intralingual speaking and then interlingual speaking straight away. And the reason was that we wanted to see whether uh, the trainees with an interpreting background or a subtitling background would perhaps be able to survive better than people with another background. And I'll tell you very briefly what the results of these two studies are. Now, Ilsa, they concluded that uh, interlingual speaking seems feasible because uh, after a, uh, a four week course, uh, the average was 97.6%. And if you remember, I told you that 98% is considered good quality by the industry. Interpreters performed better than subtitlers, but not all subtitlers performed poorly. Um, translation skills and recognition skills were equally important in terms of the distribution of errors. The main problems were once again, omissions and some dictation problems as well. The results of the SMART pilot, again, we concluded that uh, interlingual speaking seemed feasible because even after just one day, of course, our students were able to perform interlingual speaking, not uh, um, especially well, none of our students achieved uh, the 98% uh, threshold, but we did have a few who achieved 95, 96% after only eight hours, which is encouraging. Once again, biggest challenges, omissions and substitutions. But perhaps the most interesting aspect that we identified was the fact that we found significant variability in performance among subjects. And this seemed to point to the fact that we needed to study possible correlations, not only with training background, but also with interpersonal traits, because how you react under stress, how you cope with multitasking seemed to play a very important role, perhaps almost as much as uh, translation skills. And this has led us to design and develop this full scale smart project, which started last year in uh, July and will end in 2023. 
uh, and which aims to investigate these issues further, but this time recruiting professionals, people with a much more experience than our trainees, because the final um, goal of the project is to try and develop modular courses for professionals who may need to top up only certain skills to add to their existing set of um, uh, professional skills. And I think uh, the final slide that I'm going to illustrate is simply uh, the structure of the ILSA course, simply because it serves as a contrast to how we structured our uh, training approach in SMART. Um, ILSA is a self-paced introductory course, and in this sense, we are doing the same. But um, the, the key difference is that they decided to introduce re-speaking first intralingually and then interlingually, uh, which is the most common approach. I mean, there's not that many courses around, but the ones that are available do this first. They teach you the basics in, in your own language, and then they add the translation component because it seems the most logical way to do it. Um, so uh, the main difference, as you will see, is how we structured uh, the, the various training components in, uh, in SMART. And I'll now pass on uh, the floor to uh, Elena, who will introduce herself first, and then will explain SMART much better than I have so far. Thank you, Annalisa. Thanks, everyone, for inviting us to this great event today. So, yes, my name is Elena Daviti. I am a white woman in my mid to late 30s. Uh, as Annalisa said, I've got brown eyes, uh, brown medium length straight hair, and uh, I'm wearing a blue top with some fancy orange and white butterflies on it, hoping that the good weather we had in the UK yesterday comes back soon, and a black blouse. Um, so in terms of my background, just briefly, I'm a senior lecturer in translation studies at the Center for Translation Studies at the University of Surrey. My background, like Annalisa, is more in interpreting. I'm a conference interpreter by training. I'm currently a program director of two interpreting related MA programs at CTS. And my research started with interpreting, dialogue interpreting in particular, and multimodality, and has recently moved on to more hybrid modalities uh, of human machine interaction for mostly uh, live um, uh, communication, interlingual communication. And this is exactly what I'm going to talk to you about now that I have the chance to introduce you to SMART. So SMART uh, stands for Shaping Multilingual Access Through Respeaking Technology. It is a project that was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council UK, as Annalisa said, it started last year. It is led by the University of Surrey, but as you can see on this slide, it relies on a big consortium of both academic and industry stakeholders. We have UNINT with Annalisa, Vigo with Pablo Romero Fresco, uh, other colleagues from uh, um, other universities in the UK, as well as a, um, a panel with uh, academic members and industry members, among which a wide range of access service providers and the Broadcaster Sky. So the project uh, itself focuses on what Annalisa explained in the first part of the presentation. So interlingual speaking as a human-centric method to achieve real-time interlingual speech-to-text via speech recognition. Now, the human, and this is important to SMART, is at the core of this process that resembles simultaneous interpreting. We like to call it simultaneous interpreting 2.0, given its complexity. Uh, but it is important to stress this uh, kind of process that we're looking at where the human is at the core, because with the AI revolution and speech recognition technology development, there are different workflows that can help to achieve the same result, which is live text displayed as subtitles. There are different experimentations that are happening as we speak in the industry uh, that are being studied. We don't have time, unfortunately, to explore those. But interlingual speaking is a very specific one where the human is at the core of this human machine interaction. And, um, and it is a hybrid modality uh, exactly for this reason. It's at the crossroads of different disciplines and it requires a very specific type of interaction with the speech recognition technology. We know from our industry members that the demand for this practice is rapidly evolving. 
for its potential to provide an inclusive service, but the industry is also struggling to find professionals that are ready to provide this service. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we wanted to focus on language professionals and providing an upskilling course rather than a full-blown training course, which has already been uh, developed by ILSA, uh, the ILSA project, for instance. So it is a recent field as well as a recent practice. There are some open questions uh, around the challenges, the accuracy of the product, the competencies of the professionals involved, and the most suitable fields of application. So that we believe that research carried out in this field, empirical research is very important to um, also feed into industry, into recruitment practices, into professionalization, as well as training and upskilling, which is why we uh, are doing it. So briefly, some main objectives. Uh, in SMART, we want to add to the current knowledge that we know around interlingually speaking by uh, measuring and exploring the human variables involved in learning and performing interlingually speaking. And uh, as Annalisa said, uh, we don't know much about the cognitive and interpersonal skills that may affect learning and practicing this. And this is why in SMART we are working with a multidisciplinary team uh, that includes colleagues in psychology, in neuroscience, that have developed methods to collect data, to shed lights on these additional dimensions. And this makes me think of what Jorge said this morning and also Elena and their keynote speeches about the importance of developing multidisciplinary teams to tackle um, you know, more broadly issues around these new practices. So um, we want to measure how well interlingual speaking is performed by language professionals from different walks of life. And this is important. It includes and is but interpreting spoken, uh, but also sign language interpreting background, subtitling, translation, live pre-recorded subtitling. And um, we want to understand how we can best support professionals that come with already an existing skill set and therefore may need just to enhance or top up, as Annalisa said, on what, on, the, on what they already know how to do in order to be able to perform interlingually speaking. And this gap is important because most studies uh, focus on students as participants. And yes, we want to develop upskilling uh, for language professionals to capitalize on existing skills and get training in a more timely and efficient manner. So we have put together to this, extent, to this uh, aim, a fairly complex, I have to say, experimental protocol that is based on a mixed method approach. So we are aiming to collect qualitative and quantitative data, again, to try to capture a more global picture, not only to evaluate the final product, but also the process of interlingually speaking. And the experiment has got various stages that I will briefly introduce in a minute, but then I will focus on the training part of it. And what we are trying to do is to collect the first extensive base of empirical data with language professionals. We, are, we were aiming for 50 participants. Effectively, we are um, halfway through the data collection process and we have already achieved uh, this target. So we are ho hoping to achieve even more. Uh, actually, the slide is wrong because um, all, over 200 professionals have signed up so far for the course, which is fantastic. And for us, it's testament to the interest also from the professional world and the will to diversify, to explore these new hybrid practices. So we, we, we could see very open mind and we were very pleased to, um, to see that. The experiment takes place in different stages over time. It takes six weeks in total, repeated over four rounds. So it's a data collection of around six months. And because of the pandemic, the project starting right in the middle of the pandemic, we had to adjust the delivery of this course. And we tried to make the most of this opportunity if you want to deliver a MOOC style course, uh, which is in its beta version at the moment. Uh, and at the same time, collect data that will be useful for uh, our, uh, our research. And actually that has proven useful because we could, uh, by doing it online and remotely, recruit participants from all over the world, from Australia to Mexico, and that's been uh, fantastic. So briefly, experimental design, because I don't, uh, yes, okay, we're doing okay. Um, 
So there are different steps, which I will briefly um, outline. So in step one, we were designed an online questionnaire to select participants, so for eligibility, and this is based on working languages. The languages of the project are English and Italian, French, and Spanish, that are the languages of, uh, that we speak in the consortium and that we can analyze in both directionalities, so both in and out of English from these languages. Professional experience, so we have a minimum of 2,000 hours in at least one of the relevant translation-related professions that we talked about. And I have to say that I cannot show you uh, data because it's still very partial, but uh, almost, uh, almost half of the participants so far have got over 10,000 hours of experience in either one or more uh, of these disciplines. And this is actually quite interesting because we found really professionals that have been working for a significant amount of time with a very solid um, solid skills in their own respective disciplines. Then those eligible participants were asked to answer more questions for a more thorough profiling on all the sort of areas that you can see on the slide, quite standard, but to get a picture of their background and experience. Then, as I said, thanks to our, the work of our colleagues, cognitive psychologists, we have put together a, a battery of cognitive and interpersonal trait tests and, uh, and, and questionnaires to, that we hope to be able to explore uh, correlations between uh, uh, these measurements and the final performance, uh, performance in the course, so as to give us some more insights into executive functions and working memory, which are so fundamental to these practices. Step three is this better version of the upskilling course that I was talking to you about and that I will uh, talk about in the second part of my presentation. And step four, after the course, uh, there are some more uh, of the same tests, cognitive and interpersonal tests being given to participants. And this is like pre and post training measurements is quite a common, if you want, uh, procedure in psychology studies. And then finally, an evaluation questionnaires to get feedback on the experience in the course and uh, further improvements, because as we said, this is a beta version. The uh, final deliverable will be the uh, one of the final goals of the projects. So training for testing, this is what we call it, because uh, I mean, the, the official name is an advanced introduction to interlingual speaking. It is a course with a dual purpose, that is to collect data for the research on the one hand, and on the other hand, to test out a different approach to training that is geared towards professionals uh, with significant experience, as we said, in, in uh, different uh, language related practices. So the course is technique specific at this stage. So it focuses on the core procedural skills. It breaks down the process of interlingual speaking into uh, different components that can be taught progressively following a blending, scaffolding and layering approach. Although we are aiming, of course, to expand it in the future, not just to have it technique specific, but also include other elements related to accessibility, etc. And uh, the, um, the rationale is that participants, as we said, may already possess some of the skills, procedural skills that are needed, and they may need simply to adjust or add or unlearn or learn new ones. And we want to develop a modular and flexible course to suit these different backgrounds. So just a graphic to show you briefly the approach that we are taking to, we have taken to designing this course. So this is more kind of a theoretical uh, part. So the training for testing, as we call it, includes um, four blocks of learning in total. So there's four major blocks. Each block has got track three components, or you can think of them as modules. Uh, one is about speech recognition software management. We are using Dragon, uh, naturally speaking, version 15, and uh, learning how to interact with the software for the purpose of interlingual speaking, and that's the kind of orange strand that you can see. Then there is an intralingual practice component that aims to train skills towards intralingual respeaking, and then the interlingual component that aims to train skills towards the interlingual, uh, interlingual respeaking. So all the relevant skills that I said interlingual respeaking has been broken down into are taught progressively. So we start from simultaneous listening and speaking in the intralingual component to um, 
simultaneous listening and translating, so effectively simultaneous interpreting, then adding uh, what we call software adapted delivery, which is this kind of learning to use this sort of robotic voice to interact at best with the speech recognition, uh, adding punctuation, software optimization strategies, and error correction. So it's all gradual and each brick builds on another to try to uh, develop the uh, interlingual speaking skills. I would say that the main difference with respect to other approaches is that instead of providing a full course on this dictation and speech recognition, a full course on intralingual speaking and then move on to interlingual speaking, here these three modules are taken simultaneously. So there's a component of SR, a component of inter and a component of inter in each of the blocks. And so intralingual speaking, if you want, intralingual practice is kind of a stepping stone towards developing interlingual speaking. So this is what our so the, 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 the sort of main <laughs> interface. We are using Moodle to deliver this course in a sort of self-taught uh, way. Um, participants, of course, have access via a unique identifier because uh, it is still an experiment after all, so everything is anonymized. And uh, the course duration is 25 hours over, over five weeks. So briefly also because i mean there would be probably too much to say but if you want any more details um about the course we will be happy to share it with you just to say you know what are the main tasks and activities that are considered in each block uh well there are there is first of all of course an alternation of theory through readings and video lectures and practical tasks and uh, in block one for instance as you can see here the focus uh, is quite introductory, so there is a video lecture to situate the practice within, you know, the landscape of uh, translation related uh, practices. And then there is uh, the module on speech recognition talking about some fundamental of SR and how to the importance of context, for instance, for good recognition, some practice on learning to speak to, to a machine effectively, then the intralingual practice mostly focuses on listening and speaking and, and in the same language. So it draws on activities for interpreter training normally used. And these are shadowing, both verbatim and cognitive shadowing to also help develop more paraphrasing skills, but in the same language. And then software adaptive delivery, what we call SAD delivery, <laughs> pun intended actually in this case. Um, so learning the articulation flow uh, and taking care of the voice as well. And then there's practice in, included and the interlingual practice basically mirrors the intralingual component entirely, except that there is of course a translation layer added to uh, all the activities. So again, these are just, uh, I mean, some screenshots from our platform. I would say on the left, you see the video lecture. I mean, of course, the readings and slide being available and downloadable on the right. I just wanted to point you to two things. First of all, in the first two blocks, the materials that have, uh, we have relied upon are mostly speeches from the speech repository of DG interpretation that are widely used in interpreter training. They are all uh, paced and uh, labeled according to different levels of difficulty so as to enable a progressive, uh, you know, um, journey into this new practice. And we have integrated in the platform also screencast technology so that for each and every task, participants can actually record the screen and their own voice and watch their own performance back. I mean, being a self-taught course, this is quite important. We do provide points of feedback throughout the course, but this is mostly um, self-taught. So that's, um, that's something that we definitely wanted in the platform. Block two uh, adds to all the bricks that we've described the punctuation element and teaching strategies for chunking and dealing with speed. Uh, and in this case, we don't have a separate speech recognition component simply because the speech recognition component somehow is embedded in the intra and interlingual practice because participants uh, practice with, uh, with Dragon. So again, there's different types of readings and tasks that we can share more details with you about, but that's the sort of stepping stone chunking uh, and adding punctuation and pausing as well. 
Then in block three, we move on to uh, software of optimization for re-speaking. So how to train word and create macros, as Annalisa said at the beginning of the presentation. So uh, the practice becomes a bit more complex. We leave the pedagogical materials, the videos, and we kind of move on to more real life materials, if you want, with a variety of speeches from TED Talks to real live interviews, video recorded, of course, uh, to address key challenges of real life scenarios of so speed, multiple speakers, and planned versus more impromptu delivery are the areas that we are mostly interested in. So here you simply can see some of this, it's an interview, um, and we have provided uh, a video information sheet with words and some context to be able to train the software and prepare as you would do for any assignment. Uh, and then again, this is just a screenshot to see what participants can do with screencast technology so they can capture both the video and their own dragon pad as it is producing subtitles so that you know we can also analyze the process. I'll show you a clip in a minute. And this is just uh, another example with multiple speakers and Michelle Obama being interviewed. And it's only to say that we embedded in this course some reflection points uh, halfway through each block and at the end of each block, again, to encourage participants to reflect on the activities and think about the challenges, how they resolve them because we do believe in the value of self-reflection for, um, for training. So finally, block four uh, focuses on error corrections and uh, um, different methods and strategies. So using voice commands, the keyboard, the mouse, et cetera. And again, provides participants with the opportunity to practice all these different ways of correcting errors and, um, and uh, both intralingually and interlingually. So in intra and interlingual speaking. By the end of the course, there are there is a testing phase, of course. Um, uh, there are three intralingual speaking tasks and three interlingual speaking tasks. We uh, created, in this case, materials ad hoc because we are interested in testing how participants cope with, as I said, speed, planned versus more unplanned delivery and multiple speakers that are quite important um, uh, challenges across a variety of different types of uh, ABT content. So we decided differently from previous training not to focus on, I don't know, television or documentaries or the specific genre of material, but more on communicative challenges that can be found across different types of uh, different scenarios. And the duration of clips is also relevant. They are much longer than what has been done in previous studies. They go up to 15, 17 minutes, so almost like a full turn uh, for an interpreter. And we want to test Samina, of course, and, uh, you know, how participants cope with duration as well. So just to, and this is my second last slide, I want to show you a brief clip, if we have, yeah, one minute, just to give you a sense of what these tests look like. This is an example from from, uh, um, well, it's multiple speakers, it's kind of an interview. We have one participant in this case that has got no experience in interpreting at all, but only in subtitling and uh, pre-recorded subtitling and, and translation. We can hear the video in the background in French. The uh, participants is interlingually re-speaking that into English and um, yeah, as I said, there's no interpreting experience here. It's just subtitling and translation. You see the members of the team to know that And it was interesting question mark. Macro Eloy. Indeed, comma, we talked about technology, comma, the processes. Comma, I had so many questions when I was listening to you. Comma, I wanted to ask you to what extent live subtitling was close to interpreting in the professional context, full stop. I know that many people in the audience are interpreters, and I am sure that that would interest them also, full stop. Macro Lucille, what do you mean exactly, question mark, macro Eloy? I'm thinking about the type of assignments offered, comma, the setups given to you, full stop. Macro Lucille, you mean the different situations, comma, the different setups in which a live subtitler can work, question mark. 
I don't know if you could see it well because my internet decided to drop <laughs> as I was playing it, but you, you get the point, okay? So the translation, all the software adaptive delivery, the macros, and all the things that have have put together into this, um, this test. And actually, after each of the tests, we are asking participants to provide a think aloud protocol, uh, sort of to watch back their performance and reflect on it. And this is just a funny comment, but very, very good one that this specific re speaker or participant made on. on um, I just wanted to say, though, that the, the little interjections by Eloy uh, there, I I don't know if anybody else is able is quick enough to get them in, but I just let them out because I couldn't possibly <laughs> do the macro to use that in there and then the thing in the that I could have taken off. Okay, so that's just to give you a sense of what kind of data also we are collecting and, and uh, what kind of insights from participants we are um, having. So to conclude, uh, we are, as I said, halfway through the training for testing, uh, sorry, the, the data collection phase, which is finishing at the end of July. I'm not sure what's happening here. And uh, we are preparing for, sorry about that, uh, next year where we will have and uh, other impact and engagement activities. So if you're interested, we have a website, we are on Twitter, and we would encourage you to, to stay in touch. So to finish off, Hybridity, these hybrid modalities are blurring the boundaries of traditional practices, and we see those as opportunities rather than challenges, uh, the need, uh, asking for the need for multidisciplinarity and more empirical evidence. And we do believe that interlingual speaking is potentially opening a new career path for language professionals from different backgrounds, again, getting away from the, you know, isolation of specific um, disciplines, but kind of blurring these, these traditional boundaries, it can open up new markets and you also want to stress that we don't see this as a replacement service, but rather as a complementary service that can be added to translation in interpreting, depending on the context, on the specific situation, and that can help us all together broaden this notion of inclusion that has been discussed today and that is so important to all of us because translation interpreting are ultimately accessibility practice access practices so these are our website our twitter account our email addresses feel free to get in touch if you have any questions and thank you very much for your attention Thank you. I think on behalf of the 97 participants that we have at the moment, um, I would like to thank the presentations um, for the afternoon. I know that we have been here for quite some time. My voice is gone. I, beside the computer um, freezing, my voice is also gone. But um, I would like to thank you very much. And I wish you, and before, I think we, we have about two or three minutes for questions. But before that, I just want to wish you the best. I think the, the project is extremely interesting. I am from translation and interpreting. So I would like to know um, the results. So I am really, <clears throat> I'm sorry, really looking forward to, to the results of um, this study and the best of luck to you. Um, any questions? I know Thank that we you. have some questions. Yes, uh, there was a, a question that I replied to in writing uh, without thinking. I, I thought that it would be displayed to everybody, but maybe it isn't. And it was about the ideal duration of courses. And I simply said that it's too soon to know. And it really depends on your target audience. It really depends on who the students are. Because as, as Elena was saying, our idea is that is the, the developing... Uh, modules that could be uh, used, picked and chosen by people depending on what they need. So if you are an experienced simultaneous interpreter, interpreter, presumably you don't need to spend too much time on listening and speaking exercises, but you do need to work on uh, work using the software efficiently and you need to learn a lot about subtitling. Whereas if you're a subtitler, you probably need to work on the mechanics and listening and speaking at the same time. Um, and then I saw that there was a, a question on um, respeaking in China. Now, I'm not aware uh, personally of respeaking initiatives in China, but I can tell you that there's an article about 
re-speaking uh, in Taiwan on Intralinear, which is a translation journal, and also that the ILSA project that we mentioned uh, carried out a survey on practicing re-speakers to find out about their backgrounds and their training experience, etc. And some of the respondents were based in China. So perhaps a good idea would be to uh, drop a line to um, the uh, researchers of the ILSA consortium because they might be able to give you some information about where in China, because you know China is a bit a bit of a general indication. It's such a massive country. Uh, so I don't know exactly where they were based. And, uh, and there was also, and I think this is the last question we have time for, there was also a question uh, that I accidentally deleted, and I'm sorry, I apologize to the person who wrote it, I, I can't remember the name, that asked, uh, the person asked, uh, why do you need re-speaking? Why could you not um, simply use automatic speech recognition, like the live subtitles that we are seeing today, for example, within Zoom? And um, I think it's a very good question, but at the same time, I think the answer is that um, it is not, re-speaking is not meant as an alternative to uh, other modes of producing subtitles. It is meant as one of the options, uh, depending on what you need. So for this particular meeting, uh, the automatic speech recognition for English worked really well. I was using it and I saw that it, it worked fine. Um, but they were all monologues, they were all structured presentations, and they were all people who spoke fairly standard accents, fairly easy to understand for the software. When you're working on television or in live events, you might have multiple speakers overlapping, and ASR engines uh, find it a lot harder to transcribe uh, correctly in those situations, or you might have background noises, you might have uh, less than perfect sound, for example, if it's an interview in the street with cars zooming past. Uh, and in those situations, ASR engines uh, do not work as well. But I think um, and then the, the third item is the fact that um, there are some language features which are always hard to for speech recognition, things like names, you know, people's names, uh, neologisms, uh, foreign words, slang words, in, in short, anything that is not part of standard vocabulary is always very hard for the machine. So the advantage of re-speaking is that you have a human being. So when you hear one of these items, you find a shortcut, you find a way of paraphrasing it, you find a way of communicating the message without actually using that item because you know that the speech recognition software will not be able to transcribe it correctly. But perhaps I think that the most important reason why ASR is not always useful is the fact that you don't necessarily need the full transcript. ASR engines transcribe absolutely everything that you say. And as we were saying before, depending on the, on the speed of the original speaker, it might be too much. It's very good if you want a full transcript that you can read at the end, but if you want to use it as a live subtitle, it might be too much. You might have a lot of information and you might not be able to read it. So in those situations, a human re-speaker is able to edit and select the most important information in the same way that a simultaneous interpreting interpreter is able to do. So that's the answer okay. I would give. Yeah. If I may add, Anna, uh, just uh, just a point. I don't know if you've already discussed workflows uh, at all. No, we haven't. We uh, haven't. Okay, my line dropped, and <laughs> apologies for that to everyone. Um, so, yes, uh, I mean, what you say about ASR is is fine, and and this gives us the opportunity to say that when it comes to the product, so you know, it's live text, okay, in whatever forms it takes. But when it comes to the process, uh, there is evidence of a variety of different ways to achieve this. We look at one, which is interlingual speaking, where, as we said, the human is at the center, does everything with the interaction with uh, the machine, etc. cetera. Um, but there are and are being used other ways, for instance, pairing simultaneous interpreting and intralingual speaking is one workflow that is being used quite a lot. 
or one that is object of another project that we are working on in, uh, in Surrey is looking at intralingual re-speaking and machine translation. We are looking at it in the context of with, with speeches from the European Parliament that, for instance, are monologic, long, almost written to be read, so they have a good structure. And although we don't have conclusive results yet because we are doing the study, we believe that perhaps in that context, a workflow like this could work. Uh, to provide, you know, for certain meetings, not everywhere, uh, to provide interpreting uh, transcripts, interpreted transcripts in 23 plus languages that are needed, also in languages that perhaps are not, where, where we don't have, um, uh, like, that require pivot languages, as we said this morning. So, but there are so many configurations that we put on a spectrum from human-centered, if you want, or centric to fully automated that need to be uh, explored and studied. And in, in the end, we're not trying to say this is the ultimate workflow that is the best for everyone, the golden standard. No, it depends on the specific event. It depends on the audience. It depends on a variety of features and, and, and variables. And in the end, it's up to us also to be able to then educate clients and stakeholders involved as to what is the best solution in, in any specific scenario. So I don't know if this goes off topic, but it's something when you were talking goes, uh, it's something quite important to stress. There's not yes. just interlingually speaking, yes. um, there's more. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And I think our time uh, has come to an end and I will um, pass now the word to back to Emilia if she is, is here. Um, because we are ready for the closing session. Yes, there she is. Emilia, it's over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much, Sandra. And also I would like to uh, thank to all of the panelists in this session. It was so inspiring uh, as the Holy Venom and, and it's Friday evening and we still have almost 100 people connected. So I think it is a good sign. And uh, maybe we can promise that uh, the next time we will plan it for Monday <laughs> or some other day. But thank you very much for staying with us for the, for the whole time. And as was said, yes, uh, it's, it's time to conclude our event and uh, to conclude our ideas. And uh, maybe at first I would like to ask uh, my DGT colleagues, uh, Nicola and Emilia, uh, to share their first impressions with us. Uh, and I would ask, like to ask them for, for a few words. Uh, I don't know which one would like to start. And Emilia is smiling. So Emilia, yeah. floor is yours. The other, the other Emilia will start. Uh, and uh, I'm happy there was no confusion. But next time for me, um, a mark in the agenda, please plan it properly not to have the whole day training. So I couldn't watch it and I will watch it on YouTube. But anyway, I would like to thank all of the speakers who had patience with me and our administrative requests. And I would like to thank them for their speeches, which I will watch later. And I would be happy to hand over to a next field officer who will organize the next workshop. Uh, I assume it will be next summer, somewhere nice, where we could go in person. So uh, that is all from me. Really, I need to watch it first uh, to be able to give you any impressions, but I'm sure it was great. And uh, I'll pass it on to Nicola, who has something to say. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it, it was indeed a very, an extremely rich day, dense program, and we have learned an incredibly lot. And uh, before I say what I uh, take away from this day, I would like to thank again all the organizers, all the speakers, the interpreters, and everybody else who was working behind the scenes in the backstage to make this workshop run so smoothly. You did a fantastic job. Thank you very much. And personally, uh, I learned a lot. And you made me discover a whole new world of translation because audiovisual translation is not uh, the core business of DG translation at, of the commission. We are more dealing with institutional translation. But times are changing. And um, we have recently uh, been asked uh, more and more to also do deal with uh, audiovisual products and audiovisual translation. That's why you may have noticed that there were a couple of DGT translators among the attendees of that workshop today. 
Um, and we are also in the process of uh, setting up like crash courses uh, for these colleagues who are supposed to, to do some audiovisual translation. Um, we are in the first uh, phase turning to colleagues from the European Parliament who have already built up a certain experience, uh, expertise, sorry, expertise in this domain, as we have heard earlier today. But we might also turn to EMT, pro EMT professors at a later stage. Uh, all this depends on how the ne needs in this field will develop at DGT. Uh, so, as I said, we learned a lot. It was incredibly dense, but uh, as I understood, we haven't covered everything yet. So I'm pleased to announce, as Emilia already said, there will be a next edition of uh, uh, audiovisual translation workshop um, organized by EMT colleagues. And as if I'm not mistaken, it will be the University of Rome unit uh, with Annalisa who will uh, take over and organize the next edition of that workshop. Um, and uh, I would also like to use this opportunity to explain to the audience that, um, again, uh, that uh, this workshop was part of a Translating Europe workshop and that uh, DGT organizes a whole lot of series of these um, Translating Europe workshops uh, everywhere in Europe. And since, uh, because of the term pandemic, we have started to, or we, we have uh, taken, you, you, we are now used to organize them online. Uh, I would like to invite you to check the calendar and see if there aren't other topics uh, of workshops that might be of interest for you. Uh, so I will put in the chat uh, the web page with the calendar of the workshop. So maybe you would like to tune in for the other ones as well. And uh, yeah, let me think by uh, expressing a wish. I hope that uh, this workshop aroused your curiosity about translating Europe, but also about the EMT. And that uh, some of you who are not in the EMT network yet will perhaps try to follow our activities a bit closer and perhaps consider applying for membership. Uh, we will launch a new call for membership in two years' time, so uh, maybe some of you would like to join us in that fantastic network. Thank you very much, and I give back to Emilia. Emilia thank Perez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, thank you very much, Nicola, and thank you very much, uh, Emilia, uh, Andreova, uh, and really I want to thank you for, for all of your support. Uh, I know you are both extremely busy, so I was happy you were really helping us uh, all of this time. And I really want to emphasize that uh, I value that together with my colleagues who are co-organizing this event, uh, our main intention was to focus our attention to training because we actually want to focus it to our students. Uh, because when we prepare our students for the profession, we actually help to shape the profession and the quality and the quality of the final outputs. And I think this is very important. Uh, and many of us follow this in our research, but, but our trainees and, and what we're doing in the other part of our work is also very, very important. And it, it definitely uh, needs uh, the attention. So, so I hope uh, our aim was, was fulfilled. And at this moment, I uh, want to thank once more uh, my colleagues. Unfortunately, Yolita, Yolita cannot be uh, with us anymore, but I'm sending greetings. Uh, and I want to thank Gerd, Alina, Sandra, uh, and Annalisa uh, for, for joining me. And I would like to ask them whether they have some ideas they would like to share uh, for our conclusions. If I may, rather than uh, expressing my ideas, I think uh, I should probably say some, something about the next event uh, because it's already been announced. Well, of course, I'm glad to hear from Nicola that we are going to host this because, of course, that is provided that our application for funding is accepted by DGT. <laughs> so I take that as a promise. <laughs> I try my best, but you have to make it. <laughs> Nothing is guaranteed. But, yeah, I know, uh, I know. We, we'll, we'll sort it out. I know. But yes, I'm already in contact with the Italian field officer in Rome, and our intention is to, uh, to apply for uh, the next spring. So we'll be applying in January to have the event possibly in May or June next year. And the reason being that I organized another uh, translation um, 
uh, translating your workshop this year in January. So, I mean, two in a year is too much even for me. And in case you're interested, uh, the recordings are still available on the uh, YouTube channel. It was about um, speech recognition and also MT, neural MT, etc. So if you're interested, just go there and have a look at it. No, my, my, um, my only intervention now is basically uh, an appeal to all of you. We haven't uh, drafted the, the um, proposal yet, and it would be interesting to hear what the people who were here today think uh, would be a, a good topic whether you think that something has not been touched upon at all or whether something is not being developed enough, and especially format. Um, I think this, because this was the first event, of course, it made a lot of sense to have presentations of this kind geared towards training and also aimed at giving us an overview of all the various aspects of audiovisual translation that are taught uh, that are being taught in uh, our universities. Uh, but in terms of format, I was wondering whether perhaps for the next event, uh, people might prefer something uh, of a mixture between uh, lectures and a practical workshop, perhaps a hands-on uh, part, or whether uh, it might be more useful to have uh, like a round table format, whether you would like students to play uh, more of an active role in uh, getting involved in discussions. Uh, what do you think? If you have any ideas, uh, of course I have my own ideas, but I think it's a lot um, better if we pool our resources together. If you have any ideas, just um, talk now <laughs> or send me an email later on and uh, I'll be happy to ponder over those. Thank you very much, Annalisa. And uh, after the event, we will also be reaching out to our participants and ask them for feedback for this event. And we will for sure include uh, a section on their ideas and suggestions. So as Annalisa said, uh, absolutely, we are very open to, to all of your ideas, opinions, suggestions. So, so please do participate uh, in the next survey sent from our working group. Uh, it's not the first one, it's not the last one, but this is very important. Uh, Gerd. Yes, thank you, Emilia, and, and thank you, everybody. It was, as already mentioned and emphasized many times, a very interesting uh, day. Uh, I think we all learned a lot. And um, I think a couple of things I take away, um, well, we, we probably, we already know them, but I think in, in our field, what sets us apart from many other fields is that, that we have a very close, that there is a very close link between academia and the professional world. So Annalisa, if anything, uh, one idea for your, um, the next uh, event could maybe be to involve even more because we had one or two speakers um, coming from, from the industry, having more people from the industry there, not just for us, I think, but also for our students. Because Jorge, in, in his talk this morning, he talked about being on the same page and it would be good to hear from these people uh, what they think. So that's one thing I learned, one idea I had. And the other one is that we are in, in a field that's developing um, so fast in terms of technology um, that I think it would also be very good if we had someone with a technological background to give an overview of, of the, the possibilities from a different side, not just from our side, because we know what we use. Uh, and, and some of us, like Alina, gave a lot of uh, useful tools that we can, can use. But to see how they are actually used in, in, in practice, I think these would be good topics, um, not just for us, but also for the students. That were my thoughts, uh, Emilia. I absolutely agree. And I think we are collecting enough material for several summer schools, and that's actually a very good signal. Uh, Sandra, would you like to add anything? Well, uh, first of all, um, I think that a lot has been said. and. Um, uh, I really, uh, I would have a lot to say, but uh, I think I agree um, in general uh, with what all of you have said is that there's, um, a, for me, there's a need to, to learn. I, I think that this is uh, the most important lesson for me today is that 
we're always learning and um, these types of workshops, whether half day, one day or a full week, uh, have to fit into our schedule. It's not just research and it's not just teaching because if we don't uh, meet and talk and discuss and hear what other people are doing, what uh, is being developed by the industry, uh, what is being done by other universities and by other colleagues and professionals, then um, we will just uh, stop in time. And, and that cannot happen because technology, as you said, is um, pushing um, everything at such a speed that I, I, um, I don't consider myself that old, but... Um, I don't know if I can keep up with this rhythm. Anyway, so that, that's, I think, the main idea is that um, we, we have a lot to learn. Uh, it's not just our students. And if we don't learn, then we cannot teach our students. And so I think this is one of the main, main um, topics. Uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, all of you, thank you for the participation, for the information that you shared with us, for the, the resources and the, the links that you shared. There's so much for us to still go through. I mean, I, I haven't had time yet, but I'm, I'm sure I'm going to spend days going over the information that all of you so kindly shared. And um, we would like to thank, I think all of us would like to thank um, also the participants for that. Um, in terms of questions, I hope that we were able to answer at least the, all the answers were, um, all the questions were answered. I hope so, because, um, and I know that we perhaps didn't have a lot of time for discussion. So this might be, um, I don't know, Annalisa, might be an idea for some time for discussion on networking or something, because uh, I think that we we leave, we, yes, we ask that one question that we had, but there are so many others that are still unanswered. So um, thank you and um, hope to see you soon, preferably face-to-face -face in Rome. I think we are all hoping for that, <laughs> but no pressure, Annalisa. Oh, yes. <laughs> We are well. We will well, down to me. I'll do my best, but <laughs> please try. You know, arra arrange it somehow. Well, hopefully. Uh, and thank you, Sandra, and thank you also for your help, uh, especially also this afternoon. And Alina, thank you very much, Emilia. I was actually looking for the celebrate button in Zoom because usually there are more buttons, but here is just the raising hand one mm. um, because I, I would have liked to to use. Uh, to use that quite a few times uh, to thank um, Emilia, first of all, and her team. Um, so behind the scenes, there, there are quite a few individuals who, who really um, made this, this event possible. And also to the, to the DGT colleagues um, and all my other, uh, my other colleagues as well, and also the participants. It's, it's really, uh, I know this is the start of this uh, co-organizing adventure and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to to more events and just very quickly I was looking uh, because sometimes I need to remind myself you know what was the the the, the sub theme of our uh, of our event and just by very quickly glancing at it I see that it's technologies and practices and I think we talked quite a lot about both of these uh, these things I think we we enjoyed how and we shared how we use um, what are the, the techniques that we use when we uh, when we are using tools, various ones in our in our teaching? Um, I think the uh, you know the one of the the main takeaways is that, and also as Annalisa was saying in the presentation, is that the tools are meant to support our our teaching um, and our practices. And we've also it was great to also hear from our uh, from our colleagues in um, in the institutions on on how they've been using various cloud systems for implementing um for implementing various tasks um so i'm i'm really looking forward to to the next events um and my thanks to emilia once again special thanks so thank you all have a wonderful weekend and let's celebrate even if zoom doesn't 
enable us to have some <laughs> celebration. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I wouldn't say it better myself, Alina. Uh, so last thank you one, once more goes to our speakers who actually made uh, this program so interesting and also to our interpreters. I, I really admire your courage. I didn't have it when I was a student. So, so you've done an amazing job. And also I want to thank all of my colleagues you don't see, but actually they are somewhere around the studio and it's quite many of them. So I really appreciate their help. Uh, also all the colleagues who helped uh, uh, with arranging this event and making it possible to happen. Uh, so now I'm super excited because on the next one, uh, I'm gonna enjoy it and I'm not gonna be stressed, but I am really happy that, uh, that we made this happen. Uh, I'm very happy that our participants stayed with us for this long. We will be reaching out also with the links, with the recordings, uh, with the questionnaire for evaluation of this event. But uh, at this moment, uh, I think it's time to enjoy our weekend, enjoy our Friday. Uh, so once more, thank you all. It was my pleasure to have you here in Nitra, <laughs> as you can see, at least in this way. And I hope we meet soon in person. So have a wonderful Friday. Uh, goodbye. Thank you, Emilia. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Have a good Thank weekend. you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.